Coming to you live from my apartment, it's Rob has a podcast, and now here's the guy who everybody agrees is the least fun babysitter. I'm Rob Sister Nino. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Rob has a podcast here for our penultimate feedback show of Survivor 45. And of course, back here, one half of this great duo here on the feedback show. Please give it up for Mike Bloom. Rob, we are here. So, so excited. Uh, I do apologize to start a little late. I'm a little out of sorts. You caught me a bit unaware, so I just got to make some. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Uh, Okay. All right. Sorry, you caught me in my underwear. So uh, just don't look over here. Not expecting. Yeah. Exactly. Don't don't mind me if I'm reaching for any sort of like phallic looking instruments <laughs> around me. It's just my microphone. There's no idol. Mike, you're back for the Survivor Feedback Show. And boy, what a run it's been here on the Survivor Feedback Shows over the years that I was thinking of, you know, we've done so many of these. Um, but really, in this spot, I don't remember exactly when the first one was that you could think of but in in my mind i feel like it was maybe way back when in survivor 35 i'm gonna when, go earlier oh you we did a feedback show a, a free pre-finale feedback show before then the first finale pre first free that is a tongue twister is it not first pre-finale pre-finale finale feedback, feedback, feedback show. show was done for survivor cambodia uh then if i recall correctly I did earlier feedback shows for 32 and 33. And then I think 34 is when we came back. But of course, the Survivor Cambodia feedback show. We don't want to be too self-serving here. Uh, though maybe in honor of like our great fallen nerd King Drew, that might be the best thing to do. Uh, but that was, of course, the infamous birth of the great Francesca versus Five Piece Puzzle Survivor season. <laughs> yeah, okay. Of course. Uh, so many uh, great uh, moments along the way. I mean, things that were like, like deep into the run of the podcast that are now ancient history. Yes, exactly. It truly is. We have been through the times, you know, we are the constant standing in a sea full of variables. And here we are looking ahead, Rob. Now, I don't know about you uh, and perhaps due to just like the tsunami of CBS content we've experienced the past few months. I can understand if you're feeling the exact opposite to me, Mm -hmm. I'm looking at survivor 45 and I, I kind of don't want it to end right now. I feel like, We have had such a fun, enjoyable, consistently enjoyable season of the show where we've gone into some really great strategic intrigue for the past couple of weeks with the Reba 4 finally breaking up. That part of me is like, it's ending in two Mm -hmm. days? There's also a little bit of oddness in that we are talking a week before Christmas, which is very odd for Survivor Circumstances. Yeah, I feel like this is one of the latest final episodes of Survivor. I wonder if we could uh, take a look and see. Is yeah. is this the latest, Mike? I My, feel like that may, by a calendar, I, I I bet that they probably hit December 20th in some other years. What about Africa? Because remember, Africa started in October. Well, that, due to yeah, well, that years. ended in January, though. Yeah, so I think that would technically count. But yeah, I would imagine... Otherwise, they try to keep the the seven days before Christmas quite clear to get all the birds. But hey, we got all the birds going on this season, right? Here's the turtle doves, the partridges in the pear tree. They're all existing on 45, so they're part of the 12 days of Christmas now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, should we work on the 12 days of Survivor? I mean, that's basically like half the season. Yeah, I got to imagine. Uh, that's actually very true. <laughs> I mean, the 12 days of Survivor, I could talk about my time on Survivor All Stars. You know what? We uh, unfortunately talk <laughs> on about the uh... first day of All Stars. My <laughs> reunion to me. Uh, naked Hatch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think what's so fun about that, talking about again, totems from the past, is back in the day, you used to do these like. We're happy holidays, Christmas specials. And that could have been yes. something if we brought it back of like the 12 days of new era survivor, which is all about advantages. Well, honestly, I would do the holiday special often because, you know, survivor would end uh, very would end like early in December. Like, I feel like that the first year I did that was like 2012. So what's that? Survivor Philippines. Mm-hmm. Uh, although it aired, what, uh, December 16th. So I felt like there was a little bit of space between uh, then and... So that's nine days till Christmas. Yeah. 
so you know, listen, you were making it work regardless. So who knows? 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. Yeah, well, and we also know that May, for a while, it used to end uh, with the Mother's Day holiday because they would do the finales on Sunday. So it looks like, from what I'm scanning through, there was a 20th finale for season 35, the aforementioned Heroes, Healers, Hustlers. So that was quite the welcome holiday treat, I should say. It's the gift that maybe not a lot of people expected, but they got and mm -hmm. dealt with. Yeah, and Mike, this finale night on Wednesday might be Mother's Day again uh, <laughs> because it may be Mother that ends up winning this. Now, in... is, is D also Mother? That's confusing to me. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Julie is. is Julie Mama and D is Mother? <laughs> it could be Mama versus Mother in the final three. Oh, my God. Uh, those are, I believe they're both two uh, very critically renowned movies. So truly goes from the box office to the beach. Yeah, I mean, that's been the big talking point, right? Is sort of the D rising here. And we're not talking mm -hmm. about Austin's in a manner of speaking. Uh, is, is what D has been able to pull off here. And it really has been, as we talk about in Survivor, like the perfect time to not necessarily peak, because obviously peaking would be winning, but like, Certainly the acceleration has been noted. What I really like about D, and I will also come in here saying that I maybe have some like purposely controversial thoughts about the way oh. the rest of the season would go to say that like, let's not have a three hour conversation about how D is our winner, right? That's not fun podcasting. We want to have mm -hmm. fun podcasting here. So I'll offer some other interpretations about how the ending might be. Yeah. But obviously, there's been a lot of comparisons in this penultimate episode to moves that Marianne and Jesse pulled off in their respective final sixes. I think where D benefits that they don't is the fact that the Marianne move, the Jesse move, explicitly in the seconds after that vote at Tribal Council, everyone is saying, oh, that's so-and-so's move. So-and-so mm -hmm. did that. And so, lo and behold, despite the fact that, you know, they both make it past the final five round, a lot of eyes are on them now more than they were before. I think for Dino, we can talk about it. I think there is still a legible chance. And we saw this on the next time on a bit, though. Spoiler alert, a bit. I think if something shows on the next time on, it usually indicates that it's not going to happen. Uh, but I think that people are clearly going to be talking about her. But at the same time, I like this move for many reasons. One of them being that, she can kind of hide behind this group mentality. As Drew has dictated before, the post-merch has kind of been defined by steamrolls, with the exception of this Kelly vote. And here is something that you can, once again, as D, as D has done brilliantly, kind of shroud yourself around, hey, you know what? I was able to do some awesome stuff here, but it wasn't just me. So that if you're looking for people to get rid of, I'm not sticking my neck out that far. Yeah, I think that in so, like the eyes of the jury that they could be saying, like, okay, this was another move by Julie. Um, it looks like that maybe could this have been, we saw Jake feeling like this was his move. Katara is feeling like it's her move. Uh, D is like knowing like what she did. And so for all those people, I don't know if there's like, okay, well, somebody just made a huge move. And so now we've got to go ahead and flip them and, and get them out of the game. Yeah, which is nice to have. Uh, you know, I think... There is still probably a consensus fifth place person, which I'm sure we are going to get into, but that makes things exciting. I mean, listen, I'll uh, I'll throw out some stuff here, Rob, Please, and see if you bite at the end, because this is something I brought up on Twitter the day that the episode aired, and it started a good conversation about it. Now, again, we all still have three hours of show left to see, but I'm intrigued to get your thoughts. Okay. Where does D rank for you right now in new era players? <sighs> well, I guess we have to we, uh, take a step back. Uh, always. Should we start with the ranking of new era players? Like, I mean, like, do we have like a consensus, like top five? I think it would be easier in terms of like, could we sort of like, but like a top top three? Yeah, listen, you know what? Let's make as many enemies as possible within the first 10 minutes of this podcast, Rob. <laughs> oh, all right, baby. Here we yeah. go. We're getting we go. spicy now. We'll go full Bruce here and just make a bunch of smoke going on. Uh, all right, so, all right. What are the criteria, Mike? Well, so what I would say is that if I were to come up with like a top five at this moment, I think I would, and I'll give a short list. I don't think I can focus down on a top five right now. I would say... 
I'm going to exclude 45 at the moment. I'm going to yeah. say Jesse is like probably be like the number one Hall of Fame, you know, ballot person in there. I would say some combo of Ricard and Shan, you know, one or one or the other, if not both. Okay. I could see Omer in there. I think okay. Omer as well. I think really any combination of the Tika three could be in there. I think Jam Jam, Carson, Carolyn could also be up there too. Yep. Yep. And I, I personally think D could be up there as well. Okay. Uh, so. Okay. So I guess if we're going to try to come up with the list, uh, I feel like, uh, um, you know, I feel like some notable other people uh, on this list. I think I include Marianne. Yeah, I think Marianne would be a good one as well. Um, hmm. I would say. So, are we going to have a top three? Are we? Are we doing? Are we going that far? I don't know. Do you want to do Mount Rushmore? Do you want to do top five, baby? You restrict the list here. You give the the list in front of the club right now. <laughs> That's right. Um. So, I feel like f first off, I'll say if D is the winner, I put her ahead of all these people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, and here's why. And um, we can start to work some questions into this. I just think in terms of like everybody that's here on this list that we've made, I don't know if there is a true triple threat. And mm -hmm. traditionally, you know, I have referred to the triple threat as somebody who is great as a social player, a strategic player, and great in the challenges. And I don't know if we've had that person yet in the new era and I do think that D has a possibility to be like, we get a lot of people that are two out of three, but I think that D is the first person to truly be three out of three. I completely agree with that logic, which is honestly why I put the supposition out there in the first place. And I know that everyone obviously has different criteria for what is a good player, let alone a great player, let alone the best player. For me, D is the type of player that if she played on any season of Survivor, I would put my money on to do at least sort of well. Mm -hmm. She's almost like an Amanda Kimmel with teeth, where <laughs> like she has the sociability, she gets along super well with everybody. She clearly has the strategic ability, as we've yeah. been seeing from an individualistic perspective these past couple of weeks. And she's got the challenge perspective as well. And I think that's maybe the fault of someone like a Jesse, like an Omer, like a Carolyn, like a Shan, for instance, where maybe they'd fall a bit short. I think that D has maybe one of the most well-rounded games. It's a reason why I made Kelly my winner pick, as I saw a lot of similar things in Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this is somebody who is able to be at least good at everything, and we have yet to see a new era winner succeed because of all those things. They've been much more, you know, yeah. uh, advantageous in some, disadvantageous in others. And so as we talk about where D is a, this triple threat, I think what she's also been able to do, unlike Caleb, who we also sort of ID'd, and uh, this is, you know, so fun to come back full circle with you, Mike, from when we started a month before the season of, okay, let's meet everybody Going back to Caleb, we said, okay, well, he has everything. How does he not get voted out? And ultimately, uh, that was uh, not the case for Caleb. But for D, she's been able to hide in plain sight in a lot of ways. Mm. And they've been able to, you know, really not be seen as the person who was controlling everything. And so let me bring in, as we're making these D comparisons, a question from Paolo from Edmonton. All right, here's Paolo. Hey, Rob, this is Paolo from Edmonton. I'm not sure if this has been talked about before, but what do you think of D being a combination of Sandra and Parvati? D swearing on her mother last night was very reminiscent of Sandra swearing on her kids, both done with a devil may care attitude. Both are also quite sassy, opinionated, family oriented as well as just being fun and likable from our TV screens because they give very fun confessionals. Additionally, Dee betraying her showmance last night was reminiscent of Parvati betraying James. 
D is very charismatic and has a huge grin on her face and responds to everything much like Parvati. D also keeps her allies close and everyone wants to be around her much like Parvati. Are we seeing potentially a future survivor legend in her? Perhaps Traitors season three? Oh, oh, okay. oh all right. Uh, yeah, so I've been talking about uh, the poverty of it all um, a little bit this week, Mike, in terms of how, you know, there's not many times in Survivor history that I can recall. And of course, you have a great memory for this where uh, there's any sort of distrust between a showman's where yeah. somebody if somebody who is even in a flirt man's with somebody has betrayed that person. Yes, I completely agree. And it's really interesting. I mean, Allow me to be hyperbolic here. The first of many times over this podcast, I would go so far as to say this is the most complicated showman's dynamic we have ever had on the show. And I think it is because of the fact that, I mean, we look at all these showmances. I did a BNB game actually yesterday at the time of recording this, where we went through some famous showmances. The fact of the matter is, with the exception of Rob and Amber, showmances don't make it very far. You know, they don't make it far enough to test that. We always ask them all the time, oh, Matt, if you got to the end with Franny, how would it work out? But usually one gets clipped at some point, either early mm -hmm. merge, mid merge, et cetera. And we never see that come to fruition. Now we're seeing it come to fruition. And it is so much fun. I think to your point, besides James and Parvati, maybe the closest I can think is Dan and Kara? Yeah, you know, honestly, I didn't remember how that went. Uh, like, I knew that, like, did did Kara vote against Dan when he went out? So I think Kara, I don't think she was part, I think maybe she was actually part of the plan to split on Dan during the whole idol nullifier bing shenanigans that ended up with him going out. I know she was certainly scheming to, like, get him out and get the votes against him at a certain point instead of her. It's tough. But I feel like if that was really the case, I kind of feel like wouldn't, wouldn't that have been a bigger part of the story that we remember? Yeah, it's tougher because like that was what at like early merge, you know, this is like final seven, final six, yeah. it's much more one-on-one -on -one relationships, more individualistic. And so this is by far the juicier content. So I'm just trying to see. So Back in Survivor 37, it looks like that uh, if Kara did know about it, she voted for Christian at the Tribal Council where, uh, or, or, or sorry, she voted for Angelina at the Tribal Council where um, they went home. So I don't know if she was part of the vote split or what, but she wasn't voting against Dan in that spot. Yeah. So... I think that maybe she kind of like was indifferent to Dan going out more so than that she was a key cog. Yeah. So, well, let's go back to this question, though, because I love this because yes. this is what the Internet needs for how many years, Rob? 13 years have people been debating Team Sandra, Team Parvati. Hell, it's going to be re freaking ignited in about a month when the two of them. Yeah, baby. Off on, on Trader Season 2. This is is the solution poor k no los dos oh, put him in well, one no i disagree though Whoa. i don't think t i don't think t is parvati and sandra oh I, I, oh I don't i don't agree as well but i think that'd be <laughs> it'd be fun to have so i think that uh paolo has it half right i, I think parvati is there I but i would say it's a different person uh one of the legends from survivor uh winners at war that i would say is the oh. other half i think that her other half is more Boston Rob than Sandra. That is interesting, because I was going to say she's more Sarah Lucina than <laughs> Boston Rob. Oh, okay. Sarah Lucina cross with Parvati. Okay, talk, let me hear. That sounds interesting. Talk that through for me. Well, because Sarah Lucina, memorably, I mean, listen, played an absolutely killer game in Game Changers, which was all about her making these bonds, making this trust, and then subsequently utilizing it against them, but not in a way to make them seem, yes, the jury was like forever embittered with her, but at the same time, they acknowledged like, you know what? That was fair. I gave you the ammunition and you loaded the gun and shot me with it. 
Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's very familiar to not only what Parvati did a bit in Fans versus Favorites, but also to what D is doing as well, where it seems like whether due to her own credit or perhaps the demerit of others, you know, she is being brought a lot of things and decides, yeah, you know what? I'm going to absolutely make something out of this. I'm going to mm-hmm. make an outcome that is specific to myself. I also think Sarah did a really good job at being able to specifically call people from different different groups so that she got a configuration that she wanted where, you know, okay, let me take out, yes, I'll take out Debbie, but then I'll also take out Zeke and Andrea, sort of like pulling from all sides so that she wound up with her core group at the end, much like D is doing here. Yeah. So I was leaning more towards Rob because I feel like that D where she does have the ability uh, to have like, um, incredible amount of charm uh, that she's able to use uh, to bring people in. I also feel like that there are players who are a little bit afraid of her. And I do think that, uh, that she also has benefited from basically people not wanting to cross her as opposed to just like being like wanting to be like willfully loyal to her. Uh, where we saw in some of these votes, such as like when she wanted Kendra versus uh, where um, we want, we saw that it was going to be potentially Jake. I think she sort of like has put her foot down and people are sort of a little bit not wanting to cross her. I mean, I would also say let's throw in a dash of Jam Jam there as well, because that's a really fun narrative that D can bring into a final tribal council that Jam Jam certainly did. You wrote my name down. I had to get rid of you. We have seen the running narrative throughout this post-merge of whoever D says goes. And you can quibble with, okay, was that something that she should have done? Regardless, she was the one that did it. And if you talk about wanting to come in and claim the moves that you made, that is certainly something you can really talk about, which is also, to your point, pulled a bit from the Rob playbook as well. A move straight out of The Godfather, as you said, 20 plus years ago Mm -hmm. yeah so either way i mean d is you know has a lot in common with a lot of the greats and you know is really set up for you know a a, a, you know a a great historic run but mike uh, i would love to hear you teased a little bit about a contrarian take maybe it's not d yeah can i talk about how in two days' time, we might be talking about how Katora Tops is the winner of Survivor 45. Katora is Tops, you say? That's what I say. And look, I was coming in with this take, and here comes freaking Fishback on Twitter being like, well, I actually think that besides D, Katora has the mm-hmm. best shot. So feel my thunder's been stolen a bit, but okay. great, great minds think alike. Listen. I'd love to hear it. Well, I think for me, there is a reasonable chance that, first off, you know, prognosticating ahead, I think Julie gets taken out at five for a number of reasons. First, we have seen in this new era, it is the easiest, one of the easiest consensus votes of the season, honestly, is that we get to this spot where it's the biggest threat. Nobody wants to see them again yet. And more specifically, because of the convention of Final Four fire making, this is the last vote you make in the season. And so it's like, I have the last bit to execute my power. I'm not going to let this person slide by to fire making. And so throughout the new era, between Ricard, between Lindsay, between Carla, between Lauren, say what you want to about like how their edits came across. But on the island, they were perceived as really big jury threats, really friendly, and someone that they can't let go further. Now, she did get spared last episode in favor of Drew. But I think from what Drew is expressing to both of us in his exit interviews this week, it seems like Julie's doing a crap ton on that island that I do think as much as we're just saying like, Oh, she gets along with everybody. She's mom. It sounds like if she got to the end, she would get a lot of kudos for doing a lot of things that we just haven't seen. And so I have to think if I'm a player out there, you can't let that go any further. Yeah. I do think that there's also a possibility that Jake, he has his idol and he's looking for, Hey, how do I make a big move with this idol? And in Jake's mind, that big move might potentially be, I'm going to take out Julie. I think that's 100%. It. I think people are feeling like, okay, Jake's going to use it to make this big move and take out D. But that to me is similar to like, oh, Julie should have used her idol to take out Austin. Like, yeah, maybe on paper that makes sense. But in the reality in which they're living, 
Yes, the logic may be a bit weird compared to your expectations, but that's not the reality of the situation. The yeah, reality, they don't have the edit. Well, the, and the reality of the situation is that Julie is playing like one of the most visible games with one of the best stories from a demographic perspective sticks out the most, the oldest woman this season. Not to mention, let's also look at this fact, and this is also another reason why I think D got rid of Drew that we didn't really talk about. Challenges. You know, the, we are far away from doing endurance Final Four challenges, but Julie, do you not remember how much she hung in there with Bruce in mm -hmm. those first few challenges? She is no slouch. So if she loses at five, do you really want to give her a risk of either winning her way at four or winning her way at fire making, in which we got a throwaway line last episode about how good she might be? Okay. So I feel like if she doesn't win, you got to let her go. And I very much see Jake, especially what a great capper on that story as well. I took the shot at Julie all the way at the split tribal council didn't hit, but the bullets whipping back around and taking her out this time. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. I'm very convinced. Uh, totally plausible. That could happen. Final five. Julie goes out at five. So then we have this final four and here's is where things get interesting because I gotta think the showmance is in the fire making together. Oh, wow. That would be dramatic. I mean, it's gotta be. How Hearts much? Hearts on fire. Yeah, just don't lean in too far. Your heart mm -hmm. will actually catch on fire. Uh, but I, I think it's just gotta be so poetic. And maybe I'm leaning too much into, again, the incredible Julia Roberts, Hugh Grant banter that these two had at the challenge. And then all these clips of Austin being like, I'm gonna beat you next time. I'm gonna beat you next time. Mm -hmm. But I have to imagine... A Jake or Katora wins that final immunity challenge, which like might be slighted towards another person, but is usually, I wouldn't say crap shooty, but I feel like a pretty equitable competition that we've seen in modern Survivor that really anybody can win it. And so I think if Jake and Katora win it, I think they take each other and then you put D and Austin in against each other. And that would just be, I mean, All that right, would make Mike, what do we do for in terms of final four immunity challenge? So here's the thing. We've gone back and forth, or should I say around the horn across many It was things. only Samotion last season. I feel like Samotion is out. So we, we've done is off the table. 43, which is a common one we do. We do uh, Operation Balance Build, or also Stacking the Cups, which is where mm -hmm. it's on the wobbly platform. I have a feeling we'll probably do that then, because those are really the three we go around. Now, it may be something new. Uh, I I may or may not say that Sir's upcoming seasons might have brand new Final Four immunity challenges. We've seen new challenges as recently as this episode. So for all we know, this is something they could pull out of the mm -hmm. think tank. If it is yeah. an, old, an old reliable, I would imagine it's something along the lines of balancing things on a wobbly platform. What's the other one that they go to, Mike? It's it's that one. It's the motion. And what, what's the other one? So it's balancing the bowls or it's also stacking the letters to make the, uh, the infamous upside down U challenge. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And the balls, it's like going through like the may the wire maze kind of thing. Yeah. Operation okay. don't touch the sides. Yeah. And so I kind of feel like they're just to like talk through like some of the winners of those types of competitions. I feel like um, you know, Cassidy won that, Nora won that, uh, Chrissy uh won that. Mm -hmm. So Xander. <sighs> yeah. Okay. So I think it's just all about like having that finicky touch. Now, Austin, I think, might be the most skilled in that but i think if austin wins for my french vanilla fantasy to come true like he's not gonna put d into fire and then like send himself or something yeah so i see one of two outcomes i see either jake or katora wins and sends d and austin to fire making or like jake wins and is like because jake in this episode says i have to look like i am in charge of every single move from here to the final three and I think, Rob, despite me talking about this Katoro win and moving that path forward, there's a remote possibility that we get a fail wood here. That we get Jake sending himself into fire. And time and time again, Jake tries a maneuver and it doesn't work out the way that he wanted to. He goes in against yeah. D. The smoke gets in his eyes too much once again, and he loses fire. We that is the one version of this that we haven't seen. I think I would uh quibble with, I think I, I'd call that an overwood. Overwood would be good, yeah, mm -hmm. because of overconfidence, <laughs> yeah, yeah, as opposed to the underwood. So, 
Yeah, that would be pretty wild. And then, um, so that would put a D. So in this scenario, then, so so then Jake is out at Final Four. Yeah. So this is this is like my um my spring off of my multiverse. This is just a a little sideways expedition here. See, but I would be hard pressed to imagine D losing in the final three now if she got there. I agree. Yeah. So like that's but that's just a separate scenario. I don't think it's gonna happen. But like, man, that would yeah. be fun, right? I feel like in my like visions of like how D doesn't win, I feel like that it's probably where the idol play at five uh, that Jake plays the idol on D and that's why she ends up going out of the game. See now in my scenario, I think Austin beats D in fire. I think that this is sort of like him talking about how next time we show down, I'm going to beat you. And he lives up to those words and crushes her at the final. I think she would tell him like, Hey, don't, (laughs) why don't you, Can I just, can you just let me have this? Like, I'll owe you one. Yeah, and then he starts start, He starts her fire for her. Like, I got you. You can do this, D. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, listen, simpness can only take you too far in Survivor. <laughs> yeah, I just, that, I, I don't think it's 100% for D, but I can't see how she loses in the final three. Yeah, well, I, so then I think in the final three, yeah. Should we do some jury jeopardy here? Well, just I'm... yeah, talk me through in terms of what you're seeing for then Katura in the final three. Yeah. So this is so th- I guess we'd call this what like all, all hell breaks loose two, all hell breaks two s- scenario okay. of Austin Jake Katura in the final three. Cause... Yeah, here, let me just write down. Okay, so our yeah. jurors here now, okay. The the jurors are it's uh it's Caleb, mm-hmm. it's Kelly, mm-hmm. uh then it's Kendra, Kendra, Bruce. Okay, it's Bruce, it's Emily, mm-hmm. Drew. it's Drew, and in this scenario, then it's Julie, and it is Dean. now uh, Jake. Uh, no, okay. D. Oh, so, okay, so D in this, yeah. uh, okay. And so the, in this final three, this is Katura, Austin, and, J- and Jake. Yes. Okay. All right, so let's let's go down the line, shall we? Okay. So Caleb, Caleb. So Caleb had a good relationship with Austin, and this is where I start to bring in uh, some of the research that I did, courtesy of the great Gordon Holmes, uh, and of course all the interviews, Rob, that you and I did. So Caleb uh, feels like Austin is quote sneaky smart. He has talked about how Austin's playing a great game, and people don't realize it. Uh, he said that Jake was very loyal. Uh, and is a player, and he felt like Katora is a hard one. Obviously, they had a relationship, but she was the one that essentially sent him home. And that's what I'll also point to with the Katora stuff, where people want, might say, like, Katora can win. Her edit was entirely around Bruce. And first, let me also just say, like, if she does win, I feel like she was done a bit of a disservice in the edit because it was so Bruce-centric. But also, Let's remember, she did other stuff. Merge episodes are very important to, to Survivor winners uh, for many reasons. The merge episode technically was that split tribal double boot episode, and Katora was a big focus in that. She was a mover and a shaker in that episode. That being said, I don't think Caleb would vote. But even for- still, like, um, like I can understand the mergatory being a, a big episode, but we're going to say that that episode is the the split tribal council. Like... I mean, I Gabler didn't get anything in the split tribal council in Survivor 43. Well, he got no, because remember, that wasn't the first merge vote. That was the Dwight vote in, which Gabler, so. in which Gabler did get a lot. Because he won immunity. Yeah, but I, he also, I believe, was when we started getting the Alec Gabler stuff. I, I believe that so. was that episode. I guess so. I, I'm not sure if I buy I subscribe to the you know first episode after they technically merge is going to be uh, tell us a lot about the winner. Well, I think it's also from like a statistics perspective, like winners mm. never vote, very rarely vote incorrectly at the merge. So again, your mileage may vary as to whether that's mergatory or whether that's the, mm. uh, the first vote as a merge tribe. But regardless, so Caleb's not voting for Katora. I think he is uh, certainly unhappy about the fact. I that think he's a Jake vote. He's a, definitely a Jake vote. I, think I mean, maybe- Jake risked his game to try to save Caleb uh, at that split tribal council. And I think as much as he might like commend Austin, again, feel like he is an underrated player. I think especially up against both Jake and Katora, who are not only incredibly good speakers, 
but are also simultaneously having these like underdog stories of fighting their way back from losing everything and losing their allies. Like I think Austin would be a second place in his ranked tier voting. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Then let's go to uh, Kelly is a vote for, I don't know if you want to really talk about it, but this is a vote for Katora. I think so. I think Kelly had some like, interesting mixed feelings about Katora, it seemed while she was on the island saying like oh she was a bit of a mess she was running around but i do think the bond that they had was incredibly loyal i do think that kelly and kendra were closer but i do think they do have that bond with Katora. jake we found out has apparently like really sunk things during that kelly vote with just getting in fights with Katora, getting in fights with kendra which i am trying to figure out like if that's good or bad for his overall edit, does it mean that we're trying to obfuscate any negativity associated with the winner? Or does it mean like, okay, we want to make things suspenseful because otherwise if we showed that, then we realized Jake would have no chance of winning. Okay. Kendra is going to be a vote for Katara. Yes, I would say so. Okay. Bruce is going to be a vote for... I think Bruce would be a vote for Jake. Um, I think that Bruce told me that he really had no plans of who to work with should he had play his idol and survived the time that he didn't. Okay. He said the one exception would have been, I probably would have tried to work something out with Jake. He's felt close to Jake ever since the beginning. Jake hasn't ever really done him wrong except for voting against him that very last time, but it was sort of out of necessity. And he just gave Jake that big pep talk of like, you got to stand up for yourself. And I think if Jake's able to talk about gaining that confidence from that imposter syndrome at tribal council, he's got mm -hmm. his vote. Okay. Uh, Emily be a vote for Katora. I think Emily would be a vote for, K hmm, that's a good question. I do think Emily would be a vote for Katora. Okay. Um, I think initially you could think, oh, Emily loves Austin, you know, uh, that clearly would be brokering on their bond. But again, going back to the word association, Emily says that uh, Katora is, cunning nice but a little savvy and austin is hungry and okay. so i yes. don't know how i don't know if that's good chances considering that she's not necessarily coming through talking about like yeah and we don't know if that's literally or figuratively hungry yeah that could be true as well but just this idea of like oh here's katora she's actually being very subtle and yeah you know snippy behind the scenes austin just wants a sandwich okay so drew is gonna be a vote for austin i would imagine so now drew is interesting so I think we could break down a lot of stuff from his interview throughout this podcast, Rob, yep. because you and I both talked to him. I thought he provided a lot of key insights. Drew was not devastated by being voted out, not humil not uh, angry. He was embarrassed. He was mm -hmm. humiliated uh, because he had built himself up. He visualized himself for the end. And we can certainly talk about that sort of cocksure attitude. But Drew told me after that, he said he kind of checked out for the rest of the game. He told me in my interview, I probably didn't think about Survivor from my vote off until July. And then the floodgates opened and I processed the hell out of everything. I think that was the end of my fuse a little bit in the game. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm intrigued by is what does that mean? You know, because you would imagine ordinarily Drew, one of the driving strategic forces of the season would be like one of the biggest people to talk about gameplay and perhaps bring his eloquence to a final tribal council. But if he really was sort of, you know, out to lunch for the rest of the season, do we see a Drew that doesn't really care? I think that, you know, if his friend is there, he's going to, I mean, this is like Devin voting for Ryan in the final tribal council that he's going to vote for Austin. Yeah, I could see that. I, like, I think that that anything else would be an overthink in terms of like how Drew is going to go. Yeah. And I think also uh, Drew Danny's going to vote for Heidi in the final tribal council. Like, yeah, but, we all, but we also said Franny's going to vote for Carolyn and that did not end up working out. Yeah. So. But if somebody was like your tightest ally throughout the game, you know, I think uh, nine times out of 10, they're going to vote for their close ally, especially when they did not get betrayed in the final tribal council. Yeah. So I would say that, he definitely votes for Austin. Austin. Uh, okay. I, I, I think so. Because I think he also has said, like, he didn't really have a relationship with Katora out there. And obviously, he and Jake had their differences, for lack of a better term. Okay. Julie, uh, at the final three, uh, she is, I think, closer than the edit has shown us with Katora. 
I agree. Um, she's part of the re before with Austin. Yeah, so I she definitely Austin won't vote. Did give her that idol that time. Yeah, I mean, well, listen, I think if he was a little bit less polite, he would have asked for it back to be completely candid. Mm -hmm. I loved hearing that story, by the way, from Drew that apparently what happened the day after like Austin put the idol in her bag was like they were talking at the well, Drew and Julie. And Drew's like, well, now that we have Austin, yeah. I Austin's idol and Julie's like, uh, my idol. And he's like, OK, then sure, let's just not broach this subject again. Like so incredible from Julie's part just to say, nope. I'm going to eat that. It's mine now. Uh, yeah. But I do agree with you. I think that Katora and D uh, and Julie, I should say, and D as well, we'll talk about it, I think are closer than they let on. Uh, and I think Julie is obviously not going to vote for Jake, especially if he idles her out of the game. And I think that while she and Austin have a close relationship, I feel like we really haven't seen anything of it not to mention austin voted against her multiple times was abundantly clear i value drew and d above you mm. okay so yeah so that would be four for katora here if she gets the julie vote and, it's, and, and then, it's a split vote because you know jake and austin are both getting votes so that would be it that's what yeah, you need that's all she would need uh and then d i think d would have to vote for all austin here i think like so. uh throw him a bone as much as we're two, talking two. about like uh oh schmoopy austin and d doesn't give an f like she does care at the end of the four day. two two would be wild um and you know i i think a first right we've never had a four two two i will um, yeah my my hot take no matter what and who is sitting in the final three is that i think this might be a i don't think we're getting a straight seven to one vote uh, I think the people who make up this particular yeah. jury are very independently minded. I don't think there'll be groupthink. And I think we stand a fair chance of no matter who's in the final three, all three people at least getting a vote. Yeah. So this is a good exercise that because in my mind, I had been feeling like uh, that Jake had a better shot to win than Katura. Nothing against Katura. I just didn't see the path for her. Um, but I agree. This uh, Austin, Jake, Katura final three is actually... Uh, pretty good for her and uh, but i feel like that the the more straightforward path to get there is uh, at the final five and i think this is a good question will austin return back to d and julie after this vote or will he be a true swing vote and potentially vote with Jake at the final five because if he does like, that's the more straightforward path to get to Katara, Austin, Jake in the final three. Definitely. I think the question is, how burned is Austin going to be at the end of the day? Because also, does he have relationships with Jake and Katara? It's wild to ask at this point in time. And I will say, I give so much praise to the editing this season. I love the 90 minutes. Obviously, I think it's one of the best decisions the network has made with the show in its 20 plus year history. But... One of the downsides is that I feel like we're not seeing a lot of one-on-one -on -one relationships. We just only found out like how the re before all feel about each other. I feel like we barely see Austin and Jake interact. We barely see Austin and Katora interact. I mean, we know that Jake and Katora, while I think are definitely have strategy on the on the brain towards the end game. I don't know if they're as like gameplay oriented to be like, yes, we will pick up Austin and therefore we will vote these other two out. You know, I think for them, it might be a matter of just taking things one round at a time. Julie's the biggest yeah. threat, take out Julie. D's the biggest threat, check out D. And so subsequently, I don't know if Austin is necessarily going to feel like, aha, I planted these seeds for half the game. Now they will flower in the form of my relationships with the Bellows. Yeah, I just think that he might be so burnt up of how could you have left me out of this when I told you the thing that he doesn't end up going back to them or if anything feels like, okay, I'm a free agent and then Katura and or Jake approach him and say, hey, why don't we vote out Julie tonight? Why don't we vote out D tonight? So I do think that there is a non-zero chance and like a, a decent chance that he just might be fed up with uh, D and Julie after this. Yeah, but I would counter at least in the moment if he comes to me saying that being like, Yes, it is incredible from a storytelling perspective how similar those two situations were. Literally, they probably sat in the mm -hmm. exact same location on the beach with the roles reversed. At the same time, they were markedly different. Where Austin tells D, D then tells Julie, who has an idol to play. So the goal is tell D to let her in, but like D, you better not tell Julie because then she can play her idol. 
Austin has the advantage. Dee does not want to tell Austin because Austin can then directly play the idol yeah. on Drew. Well, uh, maybe D can clean that up for him, but I think that he's not going to ha like have such a nuanced rea reaction of like, okay, well, she didn't tell me because I had a amulet and I would have played it. So I totally get why she didn't want to tell me. I don't know. Could there also be a pitch though of like, Drew was becoming so much of a threat. Like he'd crush us in the final three. Yeah. Well, that is fair. Um, some people have said that they think that, oh, D did tell Austin that that when she was debating telling. How do we know D didn't tell Austin? I mean, this episode is all about bad actors. And I will say I got authenticity from Austin's reaction. Mm -hmm. Authenticity, if you were, of his just like, whoa. I don't look. think she told him, by the way. I, I don't think she yeah. did. I don't I know people are saying that the show has been so good with its flashbacks. I don't think we're necessarily going to get a la mm -hmm. Survivor 44. OK, you're probably wondering what happened about that. Here's how it was explained in the next episode. I will also say um, I'll push back against maybe something you've said in a previous podcast. Yes, here, Rob. This is my list of complaints because you felt if D didn't win immunity, that it was so crucial for her to win instead of Austin because Austin would play the amulet on Drew. I don't know about that, to quote uh, perhaps one of Dee's survivor parents. Yes, yes. Because I, I think Dee, up until the challenge, was really pumping this idea to Austin of, Julie's going to have it out for me. And Austin at least seemed to show some concern in that direction in the beginning of the episode. He's like, you're going to have to convince everybody that you were not the one to tip Julie off. And Dee does her umpteenth pretends to be shocked face i do think if austin wins immunity or anybody but drew lose it wins immunity d could very much come to him and be like i really think julie's going for me right now you have to play this amulet on me tonight but she's just one vote yeah but like at the same time these people don't like to split votes rob so mm -hmm. one vote can yeah. be in this game well, i do think that i i mean hypothetically like if d wants something i think d gets the thing but if Austin has immunity, like we heard from Drew in his exit press, you know, and I don't know if he got into this uh, with you, but in terms of like his regrets, he feels like that he got like the heebie jeebies at yeah. these tribal councils. I think he would have pushed harder for Austin to play the amulet on him had Austin had his own immunity in that spot, mm -hmm. unless it had already been given to D. Yeah. That's a good point as well. And I don't know, maybe Austin would have anyway, just to like, if if the feeling is, oh my God, D's so skittery, I'll calm her down and I'll give her this amulet. I've also seen some scuttlebutt about how, I don't know, sometimes people feel like, okay, did Drew, did Austin need to play this amulet that it didn't work? Is this just embarrassing for him? From a narrative perspective, he had to play it. Uh, because I think for Austin, this is not just like a regular idol. The amulets come with a story, as he talks about when he stands up. This idea of, okay, we had these, uh, you know, three little dinky trinkets that were given to us on the top of a mm -hmm. sweaty hill, and I made a meal out of it, even though I was deprived of one. I voted out Jamaya, I voted out Kelly, and I got myself yeah. another idol. Like, that is, for someone who I think is maybe coming in with the smallest amount of clout to him into this final tribal council. That's something that you could put in the win column if you're awesome. Okay. All right. So this was very informative to talk this through and get to a scenario where Katora wins in a Katora Austin Jake final three. So two more questions off of this, Mike. Number yeah. one, have we confirmed is Austin drawing dead? I think so. Okay, um, I and, agree. And it's wild because, again, this goes back to the discourse on should Julie have gotten rid of Austin? This is where the discrepancy between fandom and players really widens like a gulf is that I think on paper, I mean, we talked about this in the preseason, Rob. I said that Austin was like a very good winner pick to have because you talk about triple threats. This guy seemed to have it all with the addition of no one's going to see it coming. He's the Fabio. He's this, you know, meathead bro surfer guy. But no, it turns out that he has a lot more to him. But I think that type of stuff, as well as like, oh, he's won immunities. He got advantages. It goes to show that that doesn't always translate into capital on Survivor. You know, it's a stock that he unfortunately, a cryptocurrency that he's investing in that isn't providing 
a lot of value because it feels like whether it's people are seeing almost too much into that perception and are like, well, Austin's not doing anything. Clearly, Drew and Julie and D are running things behind the scenes. Or whether it's the use of said advantages, which is accidentally basically gifting one to a person that they then mm -hmm. use to go against your plans and wasting one, even though you announced how you got it and your closest ally goes out as a result. It's a little DK chilling adjacent to me where it's like, great that you have all these things. You could have the three Rolls Royces, but like, are you driving any of them? Triples are best. Triples are best. We do love triples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As far as this final three goes also, Mike, the second part of my question, have we confirmed that Jake, a popular winner pick, is in fact drawing dead? See, I don't think drawing dead. I think there's a chance because, and listen, maybe this is just me manifesting because this is the guy who I talked to in the preseason who's like, I'm ready to bring bullshit and back to final tribal council. He's a, an avowed fan of Chris Doherty. He feels like some of the best survivor players get to do this, that like, it's a game about lying. Why can't you lie at final tribal council? And so I want it to happen. I am dying for it to happen. Okay. Comes What's in his lie? What's his lie at final tribal council? I think his, well, that's the tough thing though. Cause that's a preseason conversation where I would imagine he'd have a lot more power to execute. Before, what would uh, be the most effective lie for Jake to make up at tribal council? Is it a something about the game? B, mm -hmm. some uh something about his backstory. Mm. See something about his profession. Mm -hmm. What if he said he actually wasn't a lawyer? And what is he? He is an actor. Okay. He could say, "I've been trained to lie this whole time. I put on a character." This is when Rob he drops the accent. I've been fooling you this, this whole Whoa. time. My name is Jake O'Kane. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. You thought I did that Baintown accent? That's laughable. Y'all fell for it. Okay, so he outs himself as being uh, a secret Southerner. <laughs> exactly, the secret Southerner, and that Southerner's like, I I couldn't have said it. Because y'all know that Southern charm. Hell, Sabaya got booed the hell out of here. You voted Miss Julie out. You think I'm saying I'm coming from south of Mason-Dixon line? You mm -hmm. wake up and smell the grits, jury. Yeah. So I had to convince you all that I was a lawyer. Exactly. So that y'all could take me Because nobody would ever think to make up a fake job of being a lawyer. Exactly. So that you know you take me to the end. And so I can say, no, 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 no. I ain't no lawyer. Turns out I'm a different type, a talker. An auctioneer? An auctioneer. Would be, well, what I will say, actually, is I've said this for the past few years. I think lawyers are the most overrated occupation when it comes to threat level at final tribal councils. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, yes, your job is to, like, make arguments. But the entire idea of being a lawyer is that like you are pitching yourself to an impartial jury. They are by law not supposed to have any biases and any knowledge of the people you are talking about going into this trial. This is not the case whatsoever. These people are making decisions solely based on how they feel about you. They can hear certainly arguments about it, but it's based on how they feel about you. I think the most useful occupation for a final three participant is sales. Quite simply, hmm. I think it is all about branding. It is yeah. all about trying to make a pitch as to why I am what you need okay. in this moment. Now, Mike, are you just vamping or is there data to back up that this is a great occupation? I mean, I don't think there is any data. I mean, Brian Heideck, of course, is a good example mm -hmm. of this, I would say. And we have certainly seen lawyers, Wendell and Nick, both had law backgrounds, one back to back. But I think I came to this realization, honestly, watching Sharn Biff it twice in mm -hmm. Australian Survivor, where it was just, oh, it's a shoe in. I'm going to go in there. I know how to talk to a jury. Not all juries are juries. Uh, and I think going back to our very first conversation, who happens to have a myriad of sales experience prior, prior to becoming an entrepreneur of her own backpack company. 
D? That's it. Wow. What's her sales experience? Uh, so let me look at my article about her. She has yeah. like about a decade, not a decade, because uh, she's like 27. She has at least like five or six years of sales experience from yeah. when she left college to when she started her own company. Okay. All right. So then, Mike, are you just saying that you think that there is variance in terms of like the votes that we outlined here? Or do you think that there is a different final three that is a better win condition for Jake? Um, I think there definitely is. Ooh, that's tough. You know, because I think I don't think D putting D or Julie in there is helping. I agree. Me. I think they both wipe the floor because I think the issue that Jake is dealing with is twofold. And granted, we do have two more votes after this. And as he said, he can make stuff happen there. The first one is narrative is the Owen side of things that people have been talking about is, OK, listen, you got there. You survived all those votes. Congratulations. But how much of that was at your hand? How much of that was just Drew kind of waving his wand and being like, Jake, you're going to stay for this round. Mm -hmm. The other side of things is honestly likability. And it's odd because Jake is such a likable guy to us. Like one of the most jolly, ebullient confessional givers I have experienced in a long time. We saw it in this episode when the helicopter flew overhead and we sort of got the like, uh, anger and uh happiness from inside out with drew and jake being drew being like this sucks gosh full napoleon dynamite and jake's like come on we're on survivor can't we just he's watch like, a helicopter yeah, he's like okay i'll bite you got me yeah <laughs> you piqued my interest yeah so i think that jake has such a bubbly energy about him but it seems like from what i am gleaning from a lot of interviews i've been doing that the way he left people on the way out seemed like some sort of combination of either negative or sort of like not impactful, you know, not feeling like, well, it's because of Jake that I'm sitting here. It was more so, oh, they got rid of me over Jake because I was more threatening or, okay, Jake stared at me while the votes were coming in and I got voted out. Yeah, I think that Jake has been... I don't want to say standoffish, but I feel like a little bit like uh, that he's very guarded. I feel like in this post merge, especially like since the uh, move that he tried to make to save Katura. Whereas, like, go back to like the Kelly boot and Kelly and Emily come up to him, like, all right, Jake, just tell us a name. Kelly's like, uh, I'm not falling for that. Like, I'm not gonna. And he's like, very much like, all right, I'm, you're not gonna pull the rug out from me this time. And I think that he is not super willing to necessarily like give anything to try to like, he doesn't seem to be like really willing to like put himself out there to these other players. Like he wants to make a big move, but like, I feel like, you know, he wants to make his big move. Right. But the question is, can you sort of take any poor in the storm when your big move isn't necessarily working? And a lot of people have gone back and forth to your point as to like, was this Jake's big move? Was this Julie's big move? Was this D's big move? I mean, I can't say it's Jake's big move by proxy that his very specific plan of which Steven brilliantly pointed out was faulty didn't work. It was, mm -hmm. okay, we can't tell D this is part of my plan and D gets told. That to me signifies like as much as he got the result that he wanted, this was not yeah. actively something he was doing. And I also very much subscribe, and I I, I kind of like that we've narrowed down the winner candidates to either D, Julie, or Katora here in this conversation because that I feel like going back to the guys' night, like yes, I feel like yes. that there are undertones in this season. This season is the Barbie movie, okay? <laughs> that the Kens, none of the Kens are going to win. What happens when they're left to their own devices? They have guys night and uh -huh. a woman will win this game. We saw the four women that yep. were on that reward toasting to it. I think that that we've gotten in a couple different ways. The men left to their own devices are getting kind of the dodo edit and it is going to be a woman who wins survivor 45. Yeah. Now I'm interested. Should we make some comparisons here? Like is D stereotypical Barbie? Does she have like that Margot Robbie energy? And so would I guess Austin would be the Ryan Gosling Ken. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, is Julie like the Kate McKinnon weird Barbie? I think that at best, I think Jake is Michael Sarah. Jake's, Jake's Alan. I feel like Bruce is Alan. 
Hmm. Because they only made one of them and like nobody really pays attention to them. I don't know. I think Jake is like the Simi Lou Ken. Well, go, let's go with that. I, I recently watched this movie like on Friday, so it's just very <laughs> top of brain for me right now. I can't wait for like D to ascend. And, like, yeah, maybe... I, I probably am due to see it again that Nicole hasn't watched it and it's on HBO uh, or it's on Max. And I keep saying, do you want to watch it? She says she's not ready to yet. Well, like, does there an emotional preparatory period? I, I'm just waiting for D to win. And then she like ascends to this weird purgatorial region. And like Mark Burnett's there like, all right, D, you've won now. You get to meet me, your creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't ask me who weird Barbie is. Yes, exactly. Uh, so it's, it's a really interesting pull. I mean, I was ready to come in with yep. an entire game, Rob, and, called. And uh, hold on, uh, Mike. And, and, hold on, and, and Redmond wants to know, does this mean next season is going to be Oppenheimer? Oh, my God. That would be incredible. I mean, the final tribal council could sort of be like those, uh, those like uh, inquisitory hearings, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, Robert Oppenheimer underwent. I mean, if we have like a super smart, kind of eccentric older person, they can be the Einstein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think Oppenheimer actually took place in 45. So I think we're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think, think we're, we're due. Fine. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so. I agree. I think a, a, a woman a woman will win, whether it's D, whether it's Katura, whether yeah. it's Julie. Um, you know, can we talk a little bit more about Julie, who I think has of probably course. been the person that we've has been most underserved, I think, in our discussion uh, of Survivor 46. I love her. She is an underrated yeah. confessional giver. She yes. has her eyes. I don't think she's blinked once on Survivor 45 of it, being completely honest. It's like yeah. she popped a jar full of pet pills before going out there. Yeah. So this is Julie, and you and I, from when we first got to hear her interview, we said, okay, this is a person who's going to be very fun to watch. And what's great about her is she is a little bit cracked. Uh, and so <laughs> more so as we've gone along, I, I, I clipped this. Uh, this was her talking about the previous. Yes. What a crazy night. They all turned on me, but I played an idol that Austin gave to me. I'm safe. Emily went home. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Rob, I, I hear is that she sound. Is them? Is that, is that what that is? <laughs> is she tickling the baby? Well, they say every time a bell <laughs> rings, an angel gets its wings. And I think that was <laughs> a Julie being, uh, saying, like, thank you, D. You're my guardian angel. Yeah, who are you gonna vote for in the final travel council, Julie? How many? How many D's was that? D D D D D. That's five votes. Mm -hmm. is that is that foreshadowing, <laughs> yeah. Rob? D wins five three. <laughs> I think Julie should be a foley artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? What would that be the sound of? Uh, I don't know. Fairy poop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like what an odd automatopoeia, mm -hmm. but I, she had so many great yeah. confessions uh, this episode. Was this like, a, a squeaky hamster wheel? Yeah, that could be it. Toward... <laughs> oh, that's Daniel Reyes' his last <laughs> gasp of life in Big Brother Reindeer Games. <laughs> I yeah, that's that's the fairy dust, absolutely. I but I loved also the confessional of Julie basically being like, "Why can't nice things happen because of Drew? Drew happened." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want a um, shirt that says "Drew happens." I loved it also when Drew and Austin and then Julie and um D were talking and then she comes over and she like she like lays on top of them like what happened to us? Is that allowed? I feel like that's assault. <laughs> like like well, I think specifically Drew's reaction was just like, get off me. Get God. off me. God. Come on, lady. <laughs> Like, that was such a wild one-two punch of Julie being like, okay, they all voted for me. How can I make this the most awkward interaction possible? And then Drew says, hold my kava. I'll one-up you by, mm -hmm. like, vociferously shoving you away in response to you getting even close to me in the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I love the analogy also of the re-before, like, the fake story we're getting to Julie is, like, um... We're getting the band back together. Yeah, Drew's like, yeah, we all tried solo careers, but it mm -hmm. all failed, so we're getting back together. Except in this case, they're like, yeah, we, I forgot how we didn't like you in our band, so please get out again, Julie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reunion tour. I mean, 
it was very short lived from both the reunion tour perspective and the reunion itself, the mm -hmm. reunion. Yeah. So they're going to try to get the band back together. But, uh, you know, ultimately, Julie was not buying it, nor should she have. No, I love that as well. That like, you know, you think you've been led throughout that scene of them talking about, no, we're still good. It's all wonder under the bridge. And then it cuts to Julie being like, hell no, I don't believe him. This is Drew. I know what he was doing the entire time. He sticks out like a sore thumb. He mm -hmm. basically is a sore thumb at this point. Can we talk a little bit about Julie and if like, I feel like we're spending so much time on D and then we're mm -hmm. looking if it's if not D then sort of like, OK, well, what's sort of like the bank shot of like Katora or even Jake? But I feel like that the idea of a serious examination of Julie's win condition hasn't really been done. So I think there's a reason behind that, which. Look, let me also say kudos to the Survivor editors. I believe Rob's fact checker has confirmed this is the most evenly edited Survivor Final Five we have ever had due to just like volume of confessionals. The problem, though, is personal story. So of our final five, four of them have gotten the background packages on the show with, you know, the nice piano music, the d to d to ds and the file photos uh, of, you know, their their stories in the background. Of course, we had it happen with Jake when he collapsed for the second time. Katora, a couple episodes ago, D yep. had it back in the pre-merge when she's like, I don't know why Sean would quit. I would never quit. I'm doing this for my family. Austin, as recently as last episode, which is another reason why I don't think he wins. It feels very like Xander S to me of like, well, we got to get this in somewhere. So mm -hmm. here you go. Julie did have one, but it was in a secret scene. It did not make the edit. Oh, see, I thought you were going to tell me that we we're going to like, uh, well, what if we get it in the finale? But I feel like that that's not a good sign. If if her if her story flashback is in the secret scene, J James Jones had this also that yeah. his Genie backstory had it in forty one as well. Uh... Yeah, that's tough, right? If your personal back, <laughs> yeah, no, goes your winner chances down spiraling right there, right then, Julie. Unfortunately, more like dun 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 dun, dun. Oh, or do 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 do. <laughs> It's it's tough because I think if she makes it to the end, she wins. But at least from what I am gleaning with some of this meta stuff, as well as, again, all this behind the scenes stuff that is being told to us, if Julie was our winner, I just think we would have gotten a lot more from her. I mean, remember, this entire Julie is a threat narrative hasn't existed until the final eight. When yeah. all of a sudden people are like, oh, OK, the first time she was targeted by Jake was just because, oh, D's the threat. She's safe. Julie is her weapon. Now, what I do find interesting, Rob, is I know that Drew talked about this in both of our interviews. The re before the band breakup apparently was inevitable that as much as we were thinking, OK, it's just the Rebas are going to push to the final four no matter what. And maybe Julie had that idea. According to Drew, they were set to split up at six, which mm -hmm. definitely surprised me. Yeah, um, I don't even know why you would agree to that. Well, I think if you're Drew and you have the rest of the game mapped out, I can understand why. So just to sort of like walk through Drew's thinking at this point. So it's the final eight. It's the Bruce vote. He thought that, okay, Bruce plays his idol here. Jake goes out at eight. Final seven. We assume Bruce loses immunity. We vote him out there. Now we're down to final six of the re before plus Katora, plus Emily. And from there, I think Jake uh, Drew felt like he could have some outs, you know, because then he could be locked in with Dean Austin. He could be locked in with Austin and Emily. And so I do think he wants to take a shot at Julie at six. It just was here for him. It was bumped up around early yeah. because Bruce was voted out with the idol. But I get that is his plan in his head. Why would you then agree to everybody that, okay, like, well, this is just our deal until six. Like, are you not signaling to people like that you, the betrayal is coming at six? Well, to that point, let's talk about the meta narrative that apparently these castaways were thinking about, which again is something that Drew has talked about in his interviews that I guess the re before had enough sense to be like, is Twitter standing us right now? Are we part of any Some fan of cams at the Some moment? Uh, like they apparently were pushing for rock draws from certain perspectives. They yeah. were thinking like, but, if we just come down to the re before, that's going to be a boring season. Yeah. And, and Drew did say that. He said that in his interview with me. I, I need to hear have one other person say that. <laughs> 
unreliable narrator. No, not even tale. unreliable narrator, but I, I need somebody to corroborate that because if so, that's bad. That's crazy talk. And so like, I like, you know, we are, the snake has swallowed its tail too much. So where people are playing bad to try to make good TV for us and we appreciate it. But I think there's a point where it's like, you trying to make good TV ends up not being as good as possible. This is why Final Four fire making was put in place. It's because people are predicating seasons upon like, well, these things need to happen. These people need to win. And Jeff Probst agreed. And so he said, let's put in more conventions to let big stars get to the end and win a final three, final four fire making, et cetera, et cetera. And so... It's very much that line of logic, but I agree. I mean, listen, from an entertainment perspective, it's great, but players shouldn't have that yeah. in mind. That's not on you. Survivor. That's not on you. Get that money, baby. You do. If everybody does what's best for them, everything else will take care of itself. Okay. You don't need to try to like create big moves just to entertain us. Just everybody try to do what's going to get you that bag okay yeah well not to mention as well like hey if you do this it might have the adverse effect don't do things to entertain the fans or think it'll make them happy it is impossible to predict the fickle fandom that is reality yeah. tv at large just you can entertain us in your confessionals yes that's exactly. the one thing you can control you could do that but don't don't try to come up with like galaxy brain plans just because you think that that's what the audience is going to like. Because you have no idea how that's going to be edited. Exactly. You have no control. You have enough on your brain at this point, your malnourished brain. Yeah. Don't think about like, oh, I wonder how this will come across on TV. Look at Emily. Someone yeah. who came in having no knowledge of this and was herself and was incredible because of it. Because as Drew said in the exit interview, they had like this whole like ro force rock draw thing that was going to happen uh, on the Sifu vote to get Bruce out. And then it got completely cut from the up. They didn't even put it in the episode. Exactly. So he wanted to do a whole thing that was going to be good TV. And then they didn't even show it. Can we talk about Drew for a second? Please. Because uh, I want to throw out another question, Rob. That is yep. yet again something I posted on my Twitter on the night that Drew got booted. Drew did. And was another highly contested. <laughs> Drew did. Come on. You can't say that he got Drew did. <laughs> <laughs> how fun he got boot steeled uh, <laughs> but i asked is drew a survivor villain yeah and i got i'm um, almost to uh 2500 votes okay and so i did see that i personally voted no um okay. but i will say that the audience if i had to guess 2500 I'll, I'll say what 60 percent said yes less 56% said yes. 43% said no. I am very surprised by that. Because that I, I don't think that Drew was a villain. Because okay. Drew Drew told us he was the greatest. But did he tell us really that anybody sucked? Anybody wasn't? I, I kind of feel like that. Can you be a villain solely for believing you're the best? Like, don't you need to also be ch cutting others down i mean drew did cut others down to a certain extent he definitely has a couple of confessionals where he was saying like i don't want bruce to have any more anti-bruce but i think that for the most part like uh, i think there was a lot of people in the audience that might have shared that sentiment so i i do agree with you to a certain extent but i had sort of like an epiphany unlocked to me by aaron who responded to me with something really interesting about the way we define and classify villains on these types of shows. And one of the reasons I think many that I really love Survivor 45 is because I really do feel like this was a season of quote unquote villains. Because there are many different types. I think you could have a villain who is someone who has a big ego, who consistently talks up who they are and sort of cuts other people down at their expense. Drew being a key example of that. I think you could have somebody who is a villain in their gameplay. Someone who, for example, after being informed by their, you know, romance that their number one ally is in trouble, does not return the favor the very next round. 
Somebody mm-hmm. who says, I can swear on my family, they're at home watching Jerry Springer right now in the form of D. Or you could have perhaps the more, um, I would say, majority opinion when it comes to defining what a villain is, which is like, here's this over-the-top personality that rubs everyone the wrong way, which would be someone like Bruce, which would be Emily early on. And so I find it really interesting that, A, the vote was so close because I think people define a villain differently. But I think no matter how you define a villain, I do think that this season contained at least one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess, like... I think I would say he's like a lowercase V villain. Mm-hmm. Like he is not somebody that I found to be like, he He was not even somebody, oh, I love to hate him. He was just somebody who was like uh, very overconfident about like both like his ability and his position. But I felt like that, um, I don't know, he didn't give like iconic villain for me. I feel like that, uh, that maybe he needed to have been taking more, pleasure in his Mm. like overconfidence yeah well that's was the argument around jesse right was that like jesse did these very cutthroat things but he wasn't necessarily being like hooray i did pleasure in it yeah but again looking at d d is someone who does not give an f which really stunned me she was someone and she talked about in this episode but when i talked with her in the preseason i remember rob we said i was like yeah, I don't know if she has it. That's the one thing I have against D is like yeah. she might have trouble being able to cut people. And nope, she she got rid yeah, of that. Inclination. Honestly, Mike, I think that D is more of a villain than Drew. I don't disagree at all. I yeah, think in, in the same way that Sandra is on the villains tribe. I know I said that I thought she was more Rob and Parvati, also members of the villains tribe. Uh, but if everybody if everybody in the, her DNA that we're pointing to is all villains, I mean, OK. Like if, if people want to push back on is D a villain, okay, let's go to uh we want to do some social media. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Sneaky social media segment. Come on through. Okay, is is D a villain? Okay. D in this episode swore on the lives of her <laughs> parents that she was telling the truth. Okay. Then after the episode, took to Twitter and posted this photo. <laughs> <laughs> Here is my mom after I swore to her life on Survivor. Um, these are <laughs> these are like old school wired ear but Oh yeah. Oh yeah. D E A D more like D O A. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But wait, <laughs> there's more. Oh okay? no. Mike, uh, did you see this one? Then okay, so people uh were upset about uh, about D had uh sworn on her mother's life, and then somebody commented. I don't know if this was on her Instagram, but some this person posted on Instagram. I think that it's disgusting for swearing on your mother's life. It's just a game, not worth your mother's life. D on Instagram responded, "Too bad I'm gonna swear on your mother's life too." <laughs> I swear on Treasure the Burr's mother, I am not going to betray you. I told this to my kids and they were crying, like laughing, crying. <laughs> they love this so much. I, As did I love D, it. who then I, uh, somebody had posted to Twitter and she is crying, laughing. I love that she does not give an F or a D. That is incredible. Yeah, I was going to come in here and and totally make the same point. I think D is the much bigger stereotypical survivor villain than Drew. was. I think Drew talks with that villain energy. He's got that BVE, to be completely honest. But I think if you break down, like, what do we typically see from a villain? I think it's D, bar none. Add on to the fact that, like, she seemingly doesn't have a lot of remorse behind it. For as much talk as there's been this entire season of, like, oh, it's tough to get emotions involved. She has been the one who has become almost the most calcified to it, to be like, no, no, no. I have been forged in it. Remember when Sean gave a big impassioned speech about how his cup was full and he just wanted to go home and see his husband and how everybody could, could you just grant him that wish and that his journey had been completed? Just send him out of the game. And Dee said, no. No, <laughs> Sifu. Sorry, now's Sifu. Our chance to vote for Sifu. To which she voted for with the STFU vote. And then remember when J. Maya was like, hey, I'll take the fall for this. Just tell him it was me. 
And then D said to Julie, hey, should we go to Sifu and just vote out J Maya? And then remember the next round when it's mergatory and they're like, hey, everybody, nice to meet you. Let's get rid of J Maya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm not saying like, oh, we love villains. That's the thing is I think people conflate villains as well with like people you hate. And certainly that can be the case, but there's also that love to hate stuff as well. I would garner the villains on that. A lot of the female villains on that tribe of Survivor Heroes versus villains are like people that we love. We rooted for the Black Widow Brigade mm -hmm. in Survivor Micronesia. So it's not like, well, she's not a villain because I like her. Hell, we live in an era of peak TV where freaking anti-heroes and villains are headlining all these shows the entire time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, look, uh, villain, not a bad thing. Uh, I just feel like that Drew... I wasn't get like he wasn't really giving villain for me. Well, I think it's also compounded by the fact, and you brought this up after your exit interview, but still in the podcast. Like, we also need to remember this guy played when he was 22. When I was talking with him, he was in his last semester of college. Remember where you were in your last semester of college, <laughs> how you felt. Big for your britches would be an understatement. You mm -hmm. thought the world was in the palm of your hairy hand. And look at you now. You've been shorn and you've been shamed. I think that this was a case, almost to a certain extent, like what we saw from someone like JD back in 41 of like, I, I think I can do this. I'm someone that has been able to take on any challenge that faces me, only to get, I think, very humbled at the end of the day. And I will say, good for Drew to be able to make it so far in the game with so much power that understandably he would get a bit of a big head about himself. Plus again, it makes great TV at the same time. I was lapping it up. I know that they bury drew in this episode. He mentioned Roger Sexton a number. Yeah, of times. I mean, he did. He did uh, with me as well. Um, I did felt like I, I think I would have used a different verb uh, considering that you know, Roger has, has recently passed and I would not have gone with. Well, you say Clay um, Jordan. No, I think I would have said like, uh, like, yeah, I really, uh, Chris they Noble really hung, did. I think he was, they really hung me out to dry in my edit. Like, uh, I think no, Chris Noble, I think would be a yeah. good one as well of just like build up to be super. No, I, just, I, just, I don't think I would have gone with the, you know, I'm, I'm buried. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's yeah. true as well. I didn't even necessarily think about that, mm -hmm. but I also find it funny that Drew, who has such like old man energy. Like, he basically Benjamin buttoned himself out on the island, like, aged 50 years by the end of it, that he was the grumpy old man mm -hmm. took Bruce's title by the end of it, is, like, uh, like uh, comparing himself to the oldest contestant on Survivor the Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I Look, I appreciated the very dated reference. I didn't know if anybody he was talking to even knew who he was talking about, but um, definitely it. <laughs> I, I got what he was uh, putting down. Um, he was then like in this episode also like he got left alone to go after he didn't even get to go on the reward and he was kind of salty about it he didn't want to be left back there to watch julie kind of salty call him morton he was salty af yeah um we saw him throw the pot <laughs> the lid to the to the rice out uh that he was so I... angry I saw some good edits uh, where that uh, that that got combined into like a Captain America shield launch. Yeah, I mean, listen, Drew is blonde. You know, you know what? He looks a lot like Steve Rogers before the Super Soldier. Before, there. Yeah. <laughs> kind of checked it into. <laughs> yeah, um, he was talking about how, like, uh, you know, Jake was trying to make the point of how, like, hey, every day out here on Survivor is a good day. Um, Drew disagreed. He said this. I want you to know that I spent an hour a day scraping rice off the side of this crusty, gross, dirty pot. On so, Survivor. Yeah, but we're doing pretty bad. <laughs> Why does he have to spend an hour a day <laughs> scraping the pot? Was that on the chore wheel? Did they all draw sticks of like who would do what? And Drew just consistently drew pot scraping? Is he cleaning it? Is he the best pot cleaner? Is he well, trying? Is he like a Boston Rob to get the crispy rice? I don't think this is hyperbole, Rob, because let's go back to the inimitable playing with the boys sequence. What was he doing down by the beach? Cleaning the pot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah. I think, you know what it was? 
I think he was starting to go a little stir crazy there. Allow me to make another Survivor of the Amazon reference. Yeah. Why does he want that pot so pot clean? So clean? <laughs> I think he's going to cook him in it. Is that he was what he hungry. was doing? Yeah. He was hungry. He was so, like, that's the unfortunate thing. Yeah. And I think, listen, Drew is a tall drink of water. Uh, and I think that he was maybe feeling a bit of like what happened to Mitchell Olsen back in the day of like the elements really yeah. getting to him. And so it seemed like he was just dragging his feet by the end of it. And all that being said, good on him for like winning challenges by the end while still probably existing on negative calories. Okay, Mike, let's talk a little bit about Drew the babysitter, because I feel like that as a character. <laughs> What do you think about the energy as a parent, Mike? <laughs> All right. How many dollars an hour would you pay for Drew to come in and watch Asher for a few hours? He'd have to pay me. I'm not <laughs> letting this man in here. With that attitude, my son is Julie. My son <laughs> is running around with the most frantic, frenetic energy, consistently asking questions. <laughs> Honestly, that's his middle name, basically. This kid is relentless. He is, <laughs> if Tony Vlacos became boss baby, is what my child is. Wow. <laughs> He's like, Dad, come on. Can you give me my snacks, Dad? Uh, but he, he's like, this, this kid will not stop. He cannot meet the immovable. He's the unstoppable force, and he cannot meet the immovable object that is Drew Basile at this mode coming in and being like, all right, this, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> okay. You know where I could be? On a, on a date with my two friends as a third wheel. I'd much rather be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but instead, he was supposed to be watching Julie for the idol. Did not seem to do that job at all. See, that's the thing. Drew was the older sibling, ironically enough, that was hired of like, listen, we're going out. We can't hire a babysitter. Can you do it? And he's like, why do I have to do this? I have other places I want to be. And then mm -hmm. when he does, he's negligent because he doesn't care. Also, another reason, with no offense to Drew, that I would not necessarily want to bring him in to watch my son is because like Drew's form of entertainment would be like, okay, young four-year-old child do you want to hear about the napoleonic wars <laughs> yeah. how about the works <laughs> be good for nap time maybe yeah how about the works of john locke does that intrigue you <laughs> story time for sure yeah <laughs> so uh the theme of babysitting though was all over this episode um it came through that jake is the fun babysitter uh that he's gonna let oh. julie do whatever she wants i say i would i would have jake but only if I do not value the state of my house when I get mm -hmm. back. Because I think Jake would be like, yeah, jump off the table. It's fine. They could buy another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I liked also when he was talking about how, like, uh, they told Drew that they were looking for peppers. He's like, peppers. yeah, we're looking for peppers under a rock. We're looking for peppers up in a tree. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> do you think what would have happened if Drew saw them looking under a rock? Do you think they could really play that dumb to be like, I thought peppers were under rocks. I'm sorry. I've never <laughs> seen a pepper before. Yeah. I only saw it in stock. I think we would have got a rehash of you're a goon. <laughs> oh, this is goon behavior. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, we got to tribal council then. And Jeff was even bringing up this part of the story about uh, what, what was going on with the babysitting. So my suspicion is I was to be babysat. But you're the mom. You're the one who babysits. Right. Mm. Well, the fun thing about a parent babysitting is that one of you isn't the parent. Yeah. So uh, Jeff says, you're the mom. You're the one who babysits. Uh, I got corrected on this a lot. Um, when I had kids, um, I would often talk about like my wife would go somewhere. I was like, oh, yeah, sorry. I can't do a podcast. I have to babysit my kids. Uh, people said, uh, you're not yeah. babysitting. You're actually you're 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 being a dad. You're I not mean, you're yeah. not you're not. It's not babysitting when it's your kids. Like I mean, just... I, I agree. It's it's part of the job. It's oh, yeah. the literal log right. line of the job. I mean, if you <laughs> have a dog and you're like, oh, I can't do this thing. I have to watch the dog. Are they like, oh, good luck pet sitting if it's your mm -hmm. own pet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm just hanging out here with the dog. Like, oh, you're pet sitting? Yeah. No. Like, uh, it, it's it's true. So, yeah, very odd definition of babysitting. But I, I, I love the reversal that here are jake and drew two of the youngest people in the game and austin's like yeah you better watch that near 50 year old woman 
if your life depends on it or no allowance for you. I won't bring back any sand covered chicken from my date. <laughs> I want to just circle back to Drew because I feel like that Drew kind of got a hard time with the edit this week. And so Drew was somebody who I kind of thought could have been the winner of the season just because he was getting mm. so much in the edit. Like, I yes. really did think that he was like a viable winner until uh, maybe in the last couple episodes that uh, do you want to just speak to uh, the the good of Drew on Survivor? There is so much good of Drew Basile. I love Drew Basile as the character. And I do agree with you. There was so much narrative there. In fact, I believe right now he has the most confessionals of the season, probably to be usurped by one of the final five or multiple of them next episode. But it's a thing where I think it's less about Drew was looked at as a winner as much as Survivor loves Drew Basile. Survivor mm -hmm. loved a guy who could come in there and deliver a talking head. You know, this guy packaged it perfectly he has the energy about him he has that timbre to his voice that sounds like an audiobook that you would get in an airport he has the references that he pulls out of nowhere he is by far the most analogous person this season pulling out metaphor upon he was a go -to metaphor. guy at tribal yes to the point where he did at one point say nothing and jeff's like no 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 that's not your job give me more please say more please say more. So I really loved what Drew brought. And that's the thing is like, I didn't want him to not be the way that he was. I know that obviously he did not come across the best in his most recent episode, though, to be honest, I think this was a case of like, they didn't pull something out of nothing. They weren't mm -hmm. uh, Australian survivor, Frank and body multiple confessionals together. It really did seem like from what he expressed to us, he truly was that confident, but I think he brought such a fun, dynamic where i think he was a great strategic narrator i think he did a really great job of breaking down the game in i think a very captivating way while at the same time like bringing some color commentary to it as well i think look no further than the three secret scenes that we had this week i think it's a perfect highlight of like drew's entire package on survivor the secret scene on ew was a montage of Julie and Jake complaining about how much of a grump he is. We get, you know, uh, complete with cuts to Drew going, uh, uh, just so exasperated about everything. He's called a, a not a lovable curmudgeon, unfortunately, just a curmudgeon mm -hmm. in this instance. Then there are two CBS ones where uh, everyone's going around being like, what are you grateful for the most? And Austin's like, you know, this just makes me more appreciative of my family and I'm glad of the bonds we built here. And Drew's like, I'm really thankful that I have such a building book collection at home. I really sunk like four <laughs> to five thousand dollars in rare books. I'm really thankful for that. And then the tree mail confessional, which is usually the biggest nothing burger of the entirety of the secret scenes we get every week. It's just them reading tree mail. As D is reading tree mail, Drew, well, actually, is production. He says, Yes. Isn't there a grammatical error there? It shouldn't be this. It should be this. And they have to like legitimately stop reading out the tree mail to legitimately figure out what the correct grammar is on it. That is what I love about Drew is that mm -hmm. he was so, for such a strategist, so surprisingly open about himself to the, remember back in the day when Brando asked to for an alliance and he said, no, remember the fight he got in with Jake? Like he surprised me in so many ways between that between honestly being a game bot that shows their emotions, I feel like we don't necessarily get that either. So I really enjoy Drew. I know that there are probably more positively rootable characters, but I feel like Drew was such a necessity to this season for so many reasons. Yeah, very well said, Mike. I, I feel like that he is somebody who, I don't know necessarily like if his humor comes across just like in his sound bites as opposed to like uh, like his stream of consciousness uh, when you listen to him talk for mm -hmm. a little bit. I, I think he's somebody who is very, very funny. And I feel like that we didn't get to see so much of the funny side on Survivor. And so uh, if people feel like uh, strongly about that, they, they didn't really like Drew. I think that that's probably the biggest reason why that we kind of got a lot of the serious side of drew but not as much of the humor and also yeah look to the jury and i think this is something that was a bit obfuscated in that they tried to skew a bit more strategic than social in personifying his game but like kendra 
had a really good relationship with Drew. Emily had a really good relationship with Drew. Obviously, up to this point, he had good working relationships with the Rebas. Like, this was not maybe what we thought in the preseason, Rob, to be quite honest, which is this guy has a big head about himself, too much of an analytical thinking about the game. People are in chess pieces, etc. He's going to figure that out early on, unfortunately. I am honestly happily surprised with how well he took to the personal aspects of the game. And you could argue things maybe got a bit too personal for him in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike, let's uh, take another question. Okay. Um, how about uh, this question uh, from Abby has a question. Oh. Uh, here's Abby's question. All right. Abby R. Hey, Robin, Mike, it's Abby. So throughout the season, we've watched Austin avenge his long lost sandwich by voting out J. Maya and Kelly. But I was wondering, what are the chances in this finale that the sandwich storyline gets fully wrapped up? <laughs> like maybe at the final five reward, he'll get to eat a sandwich. Or what I'm hoping for most is if he's in the final three, they'll bring him a sandwich during the after show and make a big deal about it. Uh, love to hear your thoughts. Thanks, y'all. Okay. All right. Do we need to see, as uh, Jeff talked about on the On Fire podcast, we talked about Chekhov's gun. Do we need mm -hmm. Chekhov's sandwich to round out Survivor 45? I mean, it does feel like we were left a bit hungry by the end of it. I mean, that uh, Kelly Boot episode was, like, sensational. But I think the one key ingredient missing was either Austin losing out on the sandwich at... Oh, no, he did lose out on the sandwich at uh, the mm -hmm. auction. But then him at some point acknowledging, like, and now... Finally, I get this amulet and my yeah. sandwich has been fulfilled. Should instead of pizza by stew, should Jeff bring out one of those 12 foot party subs for everybody? Hmm. To eat? OK, well, now, first off, he did when Drew won the reward. They had the do it yourself barbecue mm, where I believe right. he had a hamburger. And Mike is a hamburger, not a sandwich. How many hot dogs did he have? Hmm. <laughs> So in my mind, he has had sandwich. I think so. But it doesn't taste nearly as sweet, I think. It's like that specific $2 bodega turkey club that he missed out on <laughs> back in day nine or whatever it was. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, how about another reward question? Lyndall from oh. Australia has one. Hello, Rob. Hi, Mike. It's Lyndall from Australia. Um, I noticed that the last two weeks in a row, the reward hasn't taken place at the sanctuary. Has Jeff finally realized that the sanctuary kind of sucks? <laughs> Tend to hear your thoughts. Thank you. More like the sanctuary. <laughs> Does the sanctuary kind of suck? I, I mean, I think, honestly, the, the reward they had at the final eight was great. Very mm. much followed up from the very sanctuary reward at the <laughs> final nine. They got one chicken yes with, like can we we can't forget about this i'm not mm -hmm. letting survivor off the hook they gave them one chicken one rotisserie chicken that mm -hmm. you get from boston market when you're coming home late from accounting season at the mm -hmm. office and there are no utensils nope. no napkins no plates no chairs here you are starving people enjoy and then the next moving on up Oh my God. There's the literally best everything. One of the season. So my logic is that the women tore that place apart. That as much as playing with the boys was fun, that those women got so drunk on all that <laughs> wine. <laughs> they did what? They obliterated it. They wrecked the sanctuary. They bashed the chairs apart. They, they broke everything. They broke everything. They started painting stuff on the walls. <laughs> Jeff Probe sucks for a good time. Call this. They ripped the roof off. <laughs> I think they said, like, listen, we're done with the twists. You keep taking away our votes. So we're going to take away your sanctuary. And so wow. they decided, like, listen, we're uh, going the exact opposite of the national park policy. We're going to leave a place much worse than when we entered it. Yeah. All right. Here's some footage of the women uh, trashing the sanctuary. <laughs> That was Julie just like kicking everything into the ocean. Yeah. 
Um, I just think that maybe they don't want to go to the sanctuary every single week. I feel like maybe they have like a maximum number of trips they want to go to the sanctuary for. Uh, they went to the sand spit this week, Mike. Uh, Jeff says uh, very casually, like, have you all ever been to a sand spit before? When would I go to a sand spit? Such like a yacht Jeff Probes comment, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, who among us has not taken the old <laughs> luxury liner to their own sand spit? Yeah. You ever, you ever hang out at the sand spit? Uh, and I remember when I split, spilled my Moe and Shandon on the <laughs> sand split. Third worst day of my life. Uh, I, I will say, listen, the helicopter reward was awesome. Uh, I had the pleasure of, listen, it is no secret at this point that I mm -hmm. got to go out onto set for next season for Survivor 46. And uh, we landed in the Fiji airport and I was surprised to find out, oh, you'll be taken by helicopter to the island. And so... Okay. I believe, and I might have to, I haven't fact checked with Dalton Ross about this. I think we may have taken the same helicopter. Jeff talked about that helicopter on the On Fire podcast. Yeah, Did it look like it was from the Vietnam era? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, you know, I found some like Viet Cong sucks graffiti, mm -hmm. you know, carved yeah. into the back of it. Um, were did, did they send it just for you, Mike? Well, Or you were the contingent? You mean like I was? Was I the exception of like you got to pick up this? Were there like you were, were there a bunch of press people with you, or you are there are that you're like all right, send the send the bird for Mike Bloom. Well, that's the thing is that like Dalton Ross and I like we were holding hands in the bird, like we got our own little oh, day here. Okay, uh, there was then, no third wheel with you. I'm no, there were like four, third, fourth, and fifth wheels. There were other CBS people okay. around, but yeah, we were the only press people on site. But it was unbelievable. We did not go to a sand spit. I would have been very. Angry. Did you do like multiple laps around the islands? Not around the islands. We did get a tour where he's like, oh, this is that island. This is that island. Uh, so even though our comms link was broken, so it was pretty much. We're just like, oh, OK. Yep. That looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, and but, uh, you know, I, I would have been pissed if we landed on a sand spit because I had just gone off a 10 hour flight on very little sleep. I'm not dressed for the occasion. I have a couple of suitcases with electronic equipment on it. The last place I want to go to is a six foot tract of sand in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> yeah. You know, something that we haven't talked a lot about on the podcast this season is that Jeff has been recording new messages to get people to Survivor like on the fly, original ones for each week of Survivor, yes. really trying to get people inspired to call in and apply for survivor um to call was, in uh, sorry to uh to to, CBS. To, to, i'm on in <laughs> to make your video for survivor uh this is what jeff had to say this week are you feeling like something's missing in your life you need a little hip in your hop <laughs> is jeff probs doing a 1-900 number for survivor applications maybe we are calling in yeah is this what you need a little you need a little hip in your hop you need a little hip in your hop I don't want Jeff Probst ever saying the words hip and hop together. <laughs> I could use a little hip in my hop. You need a little hip in your hop. Call now and come to the sanctuary. Yeah. If if Survivor doesn't get some hip in your hop, then you're dead. I when was this done right after the reward? Because like again, D and Austin get a little bit of hip in that hop. Yeah. Get a little hip in your hop. What does that mean? You know what? I guess if I'm trying, it's like full tilt boogie to be honest. No, well, I'm trying to make this literal here. So, like, listen, you know, if we're engaging and yeah. like you want, there's like a little bit of a of a hop to it. You know, a little bit of an upward motion. You want to get your hip into it. You know, you want to lean all the way in. You can do it. Put your hip into it. Exactly. Put your hip into it, and the hop will hap. Yeah. And you might you end know, up with hap. Need a little scone in your carnival. <laughs> That is dirty. I don't want scones in my carnival. Too crummy. Yeah, no, no scones in the carnival. All right. Whoa. Sorry. Whoa. <laughs> but what is that solicitation? Need a little hip in your hop? I think it's more you need hop in your hip. Because the hmm. hop is the motion, right? The hop is the yeah. urge. The hop is the energy. Well, I think that what Jeff is saying, just to hear that again. Are you feeling like something's missing in your life? You need a little hip in your hop? Yeah, it's like, are you tired of your uh, mundane, everyday existence? Then put a little hip in your hop. I suppose so. I would say more so hop and hip, because hop to me implies an actual motion. Hip, I guess, does suggest the state of coolness of like, you can be more hip 
and apply to Survivor. That's what the cool kids do. Mm -hmm. Come for the adventure. Get a little hip in your hop. Can we actually talk about slang for a hot second? Because there is something I want to go in, back in, to. Like what we do here in the winter? Yes, down exactly. a hill? Exactly. We're all slanging it. Uh, no, I want to talk about Drew. Maybe he talks all about like, I want my foot. Oh, in you said slang. You thought I said sled? I think you said slaying. Oh, slaying. No, uh, we'll go back to D in a second. But uh, slang, I should say, because Drew, this entire season, has talked about like how he wanted to have an impact in this game. I want my footprint on the game to be large, which makes sense given that he probably has a large foot size. Uh, right. But he brings in this piece of vernacular. And Rob, you and Sophie Clark talked years ago in one of like the best Survivor podcasts out there, where Sophie brilliantly brought up this idea that like, okay, we are out of the resume era of Survivor. We are now in the story era of Survivor, where it's mm -hmm. not necessarily about... I made this move, I made this move, I made this move. It's more about, this is the journey that I had. This is how I got here and why you should vote for me. Drew made a comment a couple of episodes ago, and I have to ask, are we out of the story era? Are we in the clout era mm -hmm. of Survivor? Well, I guess, can you define what the clout era is? Yeah, so clout, I mean, obviously is a big discussion point nowadays considering the advent of social media mm -hmm. and doing things for the likes, uh, obviously wanting to attract a doing mass... Doing for the gram. Exactly, for a mass of followers. Uh, and so, to me, the idea of clout implies some sort of popularity, implies some sort of communication, and I would say communion you know some sort of working okay. together in some capacity and i wonder if in the new era certainly stories can help but i think what we've seen from like a lot of these new era winners is less so like look at where i've come to where i am now because now everyone kind of has that story in the new era could it more so be a matter of listen you all like me remember i had my people we worked together on this vote and this vote we haven't really seen a lone wolf type of winner of a i made this move and it was only me type of person we've more so seen successful winners be like hey listen we're all making this experience together i was a part of that and i garnered your support along the way hmm okay uh this is interesting okay so uh who would you identify as a lone wolf type of winner? Like a Ben? Like a Ben, like a Mike Holloway, mm -hmm. even like a Bob to a certain extent, though I think he depended a bit on like his relationship with yeah. Sugar towards the end, Fabio. So what I kind of like in terms of like the idea of clout, are you sort of like saying like, uh, who is the audience for the clout? Like, are you like an influencer and you want the jury to hang out with you? Or are the jury members themselves the influencers that you are mm. trying to like is Caleb an influencer where it's like, okay, well, if I can just like uh, get Caleb to like influence the rest of the jury. Now that's interesting. Yeah. That you could, so I need that clout so that Caleb is going to want to uh, give me a, a heart. Yeah. I mean, I think that it honestly could be both in my opinion that first you could say is like, Hey, I'm someone that could be good to collaborate with because I am someone who has these people alongside me. If you vote with me, then you have Julie. Then you have that's maybe one reason why Katora moves over to the Reba side of things in the post merge is that they have more clout to them. On mm -hmm. the other side of things, you could also tout your own clout and be like, hey, you know, I'm pitching a brand deal essentially of like, <laughs> you want to vote for me a brando deal yeah offer your sponsorships to me from this perspective because i am so reliable an influencer you know i am someone who had the social capital to be able to engage and get these numbers as a result hmm i don't know i gotta be honest i'm a little like lost in the weeds in terms of like how this is different than uh anything else in the new era isn't that the point that it's all mm -hmm. the same mm-hmm yeah, it's all the same, but I do think that uh, maybe it's not even so much in the new era, but I do think in terms of like, it's a little bit more of like the group think jury era. And so I think that you are sort of really trying to 
uh, establish like, you know, some sort of like a agreed upon consent from the jury where, you know, the the momentum is really like swinging your way. So I yeah. do think that having like that back and forth with like winning over the group, because uh, we've seen where like all of these juries in the new era have just all sort of like almost unanimously gone to one person. Yeah, exactly. Which again, I feel like we're not getting this season. I think one of the reasons why this cast has succeeded is because there are so many headstrong individuals. And I just feel like if we did a jury roundtable a la Big Brother and you sat the eight jurors down together to like talk through things, they're never going to come to a consensus. Mm -hmm. I think like maybe they'd be splitting hairs with certain people sitting next to each other. But I feel like there are certain people that others are stumping for that others just don't see eye to eye with. Okay, Mike, I feel like we should talk a little bit about uh, the festivities that come after the finale. We haven't talked at all yeah. about the reunion show and our, our thoughts here. Um, do you have any strong feelings about, do you think that we'll see anything different uh, for this as we enter year three of uh, Survivor doing the live or the not the not uh, the not uh, cut to live, but the on the island reunion show live to tape. We should live say. To tape. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it's year three. It's your junior year. Do you ever really change from sophomore to junior year? Mm -hmm. Freshman yeah. year, you're figuring out the ropes like they did on the barrel this episode. Sophomore year, they say sophomore slump, but also like you feel more comfortable now. You're not the new kid on the block. Junior year, you're perfectly set. You think you have everything figured out. You're not a senior, so you're having this existential crisis about what happens next. Uh, so I think they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. I don't think they have gotten anything to the contrary, despite the mm -hmm. very understandable and, in my opinion, correct arguments of like, please don't, you know, uh, have to throw pizza and Subway sandwiches upon these like two. James Jones is in the chat. He says it's dreadful. I got everyone lit. I played bartender. Well, that doesn't what? sound too bad. Well, what happened to the production people? Mm -hmm. James, like Isaac from the Love Boat? Why is he stepping up to be bartender <laughs> here? That's other people's jobs. You have a job to do, James Jones. Are there um, mixed drinks there? At the <laughs> Maybe at Ponderosa. Do you think it's like um a, oh, a specialty wedding where there were like Survivor-themed mixed cocktails, like his and hers drinks that they I feel like we've order? only seen champagne. James, yeah. tell us are at the final tribal council now that's the question you know is this like the babysitter question are you a bartender if you're just pouring champagne for everybody when they ask mm -hmm. yeah so, so i i think that you know listen i don't love having to take this final three who have just been through 26 days two of them are devastated because they lost out on a million dollars unless you're mike turner who's just like that's eh, okay whatever and then put them through this rigorous amount of questioning it's always weird to not have the on island member or the uh the pre-jury there i will say you know did things peak last season with the reveal of madden franny and of jamie's fake idol there are a few things we can uncover this season but that's going to be tough to top yeah i feel like they have gotten better from 43 and 44 to uh from 41 and 42 i do feel like that there was like at least like the 43 had like uh the gabler reveal about what he was going to do with the yeah. money and uh, also uh all the stuff about jesse with the janine idol as well yeah and i'm not sure if we had and, and then we did have like the thing with jamie's idol but i gotta be honest i don't find uh remember too many memorable things from season 44 uh, James says that we grabbed bottles of champagne. I was pouring uh, when they were uh, when they weren't, and a person uh, was assigned to make sure that uh, Sammy didn't. Did someone just like Dikembe slap the drink out of Sammy's hand if he took it? <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to think. Of, is there anything else that they could be doing on the island to spice this up? Um, I think it's tough. The I don't think they would do something on the island to spice it up. The only thing I would say is you know what they should do. What's that? A nice postseason touchy subjects. Ooh, okay. I think that'd be very fun. There's nothing on the line, no stakes. The money's in the bank until they actually win it. Shout out to Mai from Squid Games. Mm -hmm. So listen, just for fun, let's find out how you all truly felt. Okay, so everybody has like all of the names. It's like, all right, who's the person you're never going to want to see again? Like everybody yeah. hold up. Who did you think was going to win? Yeah. On day one, who do you think was going to be the winner? That would be great. 
I think that'd be really fun, but I would like the whole cast to be there for that. Cause I think that again, one of the other things is that it's doing the pre jury a bit of a disservice by just like saying, yeah, those five people didn't really exist unless they're included in random flashbacks. Mm hmm. Um, do we have any sort of big reveals uh, that I would like? Will we get lawyer reveals at the final uh, reunion show? Yes, uh, I think Katora is very smart. I do not think she's revealing she's a lawyer in the final tribal council. I mean, it'd be incredible if Jake's like, you know me, I'm Gina Marie, I'm a lawyer. And Katora's, <laughs> Gina like, Marie. Katora's like, now wait a minute. I'm also a lawyer. Then Julie's like, now hold up, everybody. I'm a lawyer as well. Mm -hmm. That would be incredible because then everyone would have to be like, is there any other lawyers? Anyone else want to step up right now to the stand? I'm mm -hmm. sure like Bruce would be like, I'm a lawyer. And then everyone would laugh at, or maybe not so at the Bruce joke. Uh, so I think, I do think like the D Austin, it's not a reveal, but I think that's going to be focused on that I don't think everyone on the jury is as acutely aware of because it seems like on the island, yeah. The PDA has been more frequent as of late. But I, I feel like they could be broken up now. In the in the after show? Yeah. Mike, did you watch the episode this week? I they're not breaking up. Listen, I've been a decent shipper since day negative yeah. 50. Listen, my my back is as dusty as a grand piano because I don't pat it a lot, but allow me to do so. <laughs> when we reviewed that Reba tribe, Rob, all the way back in yeah. September, and I talked to Austin and he's like, I love the Rob and Amber thing. And I'm like, well, do you want to do a showman's here? I was like, I see something in Austin and D. They're the same age. They both love being yep. outdoors. They both love exercise. There's something going on here. And you shook your head. Yeah. You plucked those Cupid wings. And you no. said love cannot exist on an island, not on my watch. Well, Rob, the plant has sprung out from the crack amidst the pavements two times in yeah. one year. Okay. And I am not you letting right. you, Decent you go. Are, you were right, but I kind of think that I think it's over. It is not over. It yeah. cannot be. We can't, they can't leave the Milky Way behind. Over Drew. Blanky Blanky is going to be the breakup here. Really? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, unless D like snows him again. I mean, I think it could be something where like, it's for the sake of the game. I mean, I think that's also an mm -hmm. argument that D will make to Austin is like, listen, this was something to, to, you know, I'm still committed to you and he can take that with whatever he wants to. Mm -hmm. But I do think this got built up in this past episode that they are like very fervently committed to each other. D right. says that, 26 days together spending 24 hours a day it's why big brother showmance is like accelerates so much within that house is you're just spending so much time in yeah. proximity but we're in uncharted waters mike that we've never had this before where there's a flirt mance and then there's a betrayal yeah so then i think they are mature enough to be like listen separating the game from how we feel about each other and the thing is like it was a shot at austin but it wasn't a shot directly at Austin. It wasn't like, well, Austin, I am going to handicap you in this game by taking out Drew. It was more so Drew's the biggest threat for all of us, mm -hmm. me especially. And so, again, I don't disagree with you that like I could see Austin be a little pissed off about it. But I don't think he's going to throw away everything he's been saying about D for the past few weeks to be like, F her. She's mm -hmm. done. I'm done. I'm not getting played again. Oh boy. Um, Bing Bong in the chat says Sebastian voted out Jenna and goes, but I don't even think that they were a couple in the game. They were not. Definitely not. They so. got together at Ponderosa. Right. It's a real Alex Kara situation. Yeah. So Who I believe also Kara voted Alex out of the game. Yeah. I think it was Alec. Alec. Right? Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so we'll see. Um, I just think he could be like very hurt by this. So I think he's he a sensitive guy. He can be her, but let me read something that Dee said in the preseason to me. Because I asked her about what she's looking for in a tight ally, and is it equivalent to a business partner? Dee said, I'll definitely say starting my business with my business partner three years ago has prepared me. First of all, I've learned a lot about myself and how to be a better business partner and how I say things, how I approach things, what I like in a better business partner. Oh, sorry, what I like in somebody else to tell me how to do things. When you're in a partnership, you got to be on the same page all the time. You have to have the same vision be on the same page. And then you can have disagreements. It's taught me 
how to not take things personally. Nothing is ever personal. People don't do things as a screw you, but rather more as a pro me. Now, that's interesting because I did yeah. see, honestly, some discourse in the past week of people being like, if Austin didn't tell D about the votes against Julie, she would like be so furious and break things up. To me, at least, this indicates that she wouldn't necessarily be that way. Now, granted, this is from D's perspective. This is how D thinks Austin should be behaved. Mm -hmm. To your point, we'll see if that meets expectations. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a big story going into this finale, but I, I think that there is, uh, I think, a very real possibility that he's like, is like, okay, you know what? Now I'm done with uh, D and Julie. Well, I think in the game, certainly, but I don't think it's going to be like after the show and he's like, I thought we had something, but that got snuffed out with Drew's torch. I don't know, Mike. I just feel like that. Um, I feel like that these survivors, like, um, I'm just like trying to think of like somebody that, that for the most part, like, I just feel like that uh, these feelings, like, to, the, you heard Drew talk about how long it took him to get over like his betrayal. Like, I just don't think that uh, they get over things that quick. You gotta let love win out. Sure, sure. But I just don't think that happens. I mean, Austin did hold a lot of resentment over a sandwich. Over like a sandwich! Two weeks. Now, the question is, does he value D more than a sandwich? I think he did. Um, but I think he had this idea of them being like this Robin Amber. And then I think that like, it wasn't just like, okay, I like, I met this girl and I like her. Like also she like uh, crushed that dream. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I think the Robin Amber thing could still exist. It's just more so, hey, we are a car at this point. Don't you want to be more of a motorcycle? Let's start taking wheels off at mm -hmm. this point. We don't need them right now. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's going to be definitely something interesting to watch on Wednesday night. Are there any other like big reveal type things that we have to have on our radar going into Wednesday? Uh, I don't think there's any other big secrets because there was a lack of advantage. Maybe the amulet story, maybe the whole thing about the, the, maybe we get the story of the sandwich. Yeah, that could be it. I feel like there's been a distinct lack of secrets in this game, uh, which has been really interesting. I'll go back to an interview I did with Jeff Probst after the first episode. And when I told him to preview the season, he brought up some really interesting things that honestly, I didn't even realize was the theme of the season, even though we're in a no theme era until he said it. He says, uh, "There's first off, we'll take this one piece at a time. There's a combination of two types of players this season. There are some very thoughtful players who will tend to take their time and assess the best move, but there's an equal number of impulsive players. And I think it's going to be a little bit of whack-a-mole in terms of who's in charge and what direction the game is heading. Hmm. That's what I felt when I was out there. Sometimes the season has a flow and you can start to see the power taking shape. Like with the Tika three last season, it was early on when we started thinking, wait, is this a three that can actually go all the way to the end? I did not feel that this season. Hmm. What do you think about that? That was a word salad. I don't know if, uh, that would you say that that was a description of this season? I mean, what I will say is I think, what people kind of complained about towards the middle part of the game, which is like, how are they not noticing the re before the re before are running circles around everyone from a gameplay perspective and Emily and these bellows can't rub two votes together to make anything happen. So I could see it from that perspective that if Jeff is sort of like dividing these two camps that you could put the re before in the take their time and assess, and you could put the bellows in the just kind of running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the power shifts and maybe that's indicating where we're going to go in the next couple of votes that it pretty much seemed for the latter half of the game that it was just the re before getting out who they wanted to get out. And then only the last couple of votes have things changed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Bruce so then, says I tried. There we go. Brucey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't blame Bruce. Um, yeah. But as far as like the whack of what's that part of the whack-a-mole? Uh, I think there's going to be a little bit of whack-a-mole in terms of who's in charge and what direction the game's in, the game is heading. I mean, maybe it's like, oh, Emily's got it. You know what? That could be it. That maybe a lot of the discourse online of who was winning, because let's be honest, there was a lot of talk of like, oh, it's Kelly. Oh, wait, no, then it's got to be Emily. 
okay, wait, now it's D. And even mm -hmm. so, you and I brought up some points about like how it might not be D. And so yeah. I could see that. I don't know if that translates to like narrative versus actual control yeah. of the game. I think those are two separate things. I do think that I, I've said this a little bit during these last couple of seasons that I feel like that the seasons in the new era have been edited maybe more from the perspective of what it was like for the players. Like when you have like these kind of like out of nowhere winners, mm -hmm. I think that it was also a case where the winner was also out of nowhere for the people that were out there. Oh, yeah. um, we saw their faces. <laughs> We saw their faces and I think that might have something to do with, you know, going back to the way that the show used to be edited, that I think that the editors uh, perhaps knew the final three, but I don't know if the uh, people who were editing the show necessarily knew who the winner was, uh, mm. where they used to say, oh, only Jeff and Matt Van Wagner know the vote count and the people like who are editing the show, they know the final three, whereas in the new era, that the editors like must know who the winner is because it happened all on the island. Like uh, that, does that change the way these shows are edited? Uh, I mean, from what I have gleaned, now maybe there are a couple of exceptions. You know, like a certain returnee who must not be named definitely thought coming back from Survivor Philippines that he would be winning. Uh, I believe that the Survivor Nicaragua vote, people were surprised that it was as close as it was. But I think for the most part, juries know who the winner is by the time final tribal council ends. And I would imagine that translates to the editors as well. I mean, that's why the winner's edit is a yeah. thing. We certainly have been surprised. I, I'm going that back to uh, Molly Shock, friend of the podcast, mm -hmm. who's like worked in editing. Uh, that she, that uh, That's something that she had said, that the editors don't know the the outcome of the final three. Yeah, I mean... To compare it to another reality show, RuPaul's Drag Race now does this sort of middle ground finale where they do a quote unquote live to tape finale to reunion, but they film three separate endings. And then basically, depending on like how production is feeling and audience reception, then they're like, yeah, we'll give it to this person. Obviously, they wouldn't do that this time around, though. Apparently, I think they film multiple endings for Australian Survivor for yeah. fear of spoilers getting out. It, I just doesn't, I don't really feel it of maybe in some seasons where you're like, I don't know, it could be Michelle, it could be Aubrey, but like, I don't know how you walk out of, I don't know, something like Survivor Game Changers and be, or Survivor Millennials versus Gen X and be like, hmm, you know what? It might be Ken. I think <laughs> Ken's got this one. So let's edit for that. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. Um, that's oh, right. Yeah. Back to the, reu back to the reunion. Uh, so yeah. I, yeah, so I don't think there were any, like, twist-based revelations to make here. Um, I do think we'll get a question about Dean Austin. I think they're totally going to know, Sella. They're going to be like, we'll see after the island. We got along. We looked at the Milky Way, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think there's going to be anything as salacious as, like, the Matt and Franny stuff last season. Okay. All right. Mike, then let's then... Uh go back to uh you know here's another uh moment that i have to get your take on mm. from the episode um jake found a clue to the idol yes. and then went to go back to the raft to go find the idol. first off was that compartment in the raft all season i would have to imagine so unless magician style there was like a dummy raft a dummy they switched out raft. the raft yeah they they had made one specific raft with that one compartment that feels like, I would say, a bit of a water hazard, but at the same time, it's supposed to be hollow. It does not stay. And so I'm sure it doesn't matter anyway that there was like this random capped part of it. Yeah. And then they just never tried to take the raft apart. And then they came in and put the idol in that spot. I mean, who's going to take the raft apart? <laughs> I don't know. It's Maybe it's like, oh, this be, this is loose over now, here. No, what is it? At the sanctuary after <laughs> these women went through with it? They're just tearing the raft apart to see if anything's inside. Now, listen. I feel bad for production for 47 because now you know that's what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to check to see if any part. They're doing the, the, the is it loose. cake? Is it idle? I'm just slicing <laughs> everything around camp to see if there's an idol in it. All right. So uh, this is what Jake had to say about his uh, hunt for the idol. Plus, it's fun to search for my underwear. You know, I did a play before where I had to be in my underwear on stage in front of other people. So I'm not super concerned about searching for this idol in my underwear. It's, it's good. It was, it was a show. I was in college. Uh, <laughs> um, 
So obsession for this island, man. With <laughs> I am obsessed. This is the most theater kid energy we've ever seen on yeah. Survivor, and we've yeah. had Broadway actors on the show before. But taking the time to get derailed, talking about a previous production you were in, this is every single person I went to college with to a T, including myself. Yeah. Now, Mike, I think that there were a lot of survivors who have played in the last 20 years that uh, a little bit like, oh, really? You looked for an idol in your underwear? Well, I lived I lived for 39 days in my underwear. Yeah. Do you think that's why Tyler Perry got rid of the bathing suits? He's like, mm -hmm. we need to see people looking for idols in their underwear. And Jeff's like, well, that'll get some hip in your hop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Need some hip in your hop? You stripped out to your underwear. So I will, I will say I feel seen in many ways uh, as someone who was in less than their underwear on stage. Uh, it's, it's whoa, sorry, whoa. I mean, is this to be unexpected though? Is no. this to be unexpected? Uh, I mean, you were in your underwear on this podcast. Yeah, exactly. Like, I have no shame, mm -hmm. no shame whatsoever. Uh, so yeah, I was actually I was in a musical where in one scene I was part of an orgy. Uh, and I just wore a dance belt and I was, and I was 17. I think that's illegal. I think that's illegal. Um, <laughs> Mike, do I, do, do I, do I pry any further? I mean, there's not what much, was, un there's not much the underneath. If you catch what my was chip. the production? Uh, it was a show called Reefer Madness about the dangers of, of uh, uh. drugs. And I think, I think I, I, I helped a lot of people that day or maybe led them to drugs. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> okay. But I believe, actually, uh, the big mystery that I certainly had was what was the show that Jake was in? Uh, mm -hmm. And he gave that answer. So forgive me, Rob. We're going to do a bit of theater chat here on the podcast. I can't help but imbibe, considering that I am a man of the stage. According to Jake, he was in a production of Heathers in college okay. heathers heathers the, the, the movie the christian slater movie yeah so he played one of the two football bros um mm -hmm. and so they get killed memorably because they believe that they have coerced veronica into having sex with them and so they get down to their skivvies and then they get just chased down by the christian slater character and get killed in the stage production the characters keep coming back as ghosts but in the outfits that they died in. So of course, like the main red Heather, she is wearing the same outfit. And then the two bros also keep appearing entirely in their underwear. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Jake, by virtue of being in that when he died, a la Lil with the scout uniform, just kind of had to stand there in his underwear for the rest of the show. And I do think much like that final product, depending on who he goes to the final three with, he may too get effed gently with a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, uh, so yeah, so here we have uh, the aforementioned uh, Twitter of uh, the great Jake O'Kane uh, hidden crotch idol. <laughs> Wait, but like, shouldn't that be a middle name? Why is it a suffix like Esquire? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this is like on the bottom of the screen. This is like uh, his. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. HDI. Title, Survivor 45, Esquire, Nana's favorite, Dorchester, Thespian, professional Pikachu meme. Um, I also then clicked the link to uh, his website, jakeokane.boston. Wait, dot Boston cannot be. That can't be a thing. It is. Uh, what? It is. Uh, I thought it had then, to be three letters or two. It can't be six letters. And so he's got some merch here. What do you think of the uh, Jake merch? Nana's favorite short sleeve t-shirt. <laughs> what is going on here? The compression. <laughs> the compression alone. <laughs> Photoshop, you don't like it, Mike? Photo, my Photoshop program is auto installing from my computer after <laughs> the Nana's it? favorite short sleeve t shirt. Why are they so skinny? Like they're so <laughs> Whoa! Compressed. Sorry. Whoa. It's so stretched out. Yeah, why does uh does Jake have a face and Nana doesn't? Or that he has yeah, like wait, facial hair? This? All right, so is Jake dealing with some sort of, I don't know, like the founders from Star Trek Deep Space Nine? This like amorphous blob of a person is Nana. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Or maybe she's in witness protection once yeah. her, she didn't sign the NDA. Rep Nana and Team Jake with this classic unisex uh, jersey short sleeve tee fits like a well loved favorite. But like, why does Nana have no eyes and no mouth? What is she drinking out of? Where mm -hmm. does she drink to? So and many she... models uh, trying on Nana's favorite. <laughs> You know what? Why don't we have someone in their underwear wearing the shirt? Because that's the most appropriate venue to wear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you think this was a soft launch of the store? The Nana's that, favorite merch? Yeah. No, that if he wins, we'll get a lot more. I think we get like, whoa, I'm sorry. Whoa. It could be like, whoa, in big letters, then on the back yeah. in small letters. I'm sorry. Oh, this whoa. would be good, Mike. Could we help the survivors with their merch shop? Oh, my God. I mean, I, oh, my God. Please. I, let's I, do it. I mean, I feel like that for one, Jake, get the. Whoa! Sorry. Whoa. So, yeah. So, again, big 72-point font front. Whoa. On the yeah. back, small okay. font. Sorry. Whoa. What else? What else is in the Jake merch store, Mike? Well, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here, but Nana's favorite needs underwear. <laughs> Nana's favorite underwear. <laughs> if you want to put some hip in your hop, <laughs> Nana's favorite underwear. <laughs> Yeah. Jake also is big in the third person, Mike. It would yeah. be very easy for me to say, yep, we're going on Julie again. We're putting all the votes on Julie. But that doesn't help Jake's resume. That doesn't help Jake's resume one bit. Yeah, I don't know why he suddenly went Sifu in the middle of that sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, why he's just all of a sudden been like, you know who's a good person to mimic? That guy. Yeah. That's what I want to go with. I mean, he yeah. found an idol uh, and Sifu did uh, suppose. No, they didn't think he did the same. That's another thing as well. I'm glad we finally got an answer to why the freaking Reba 4 thought that Sifu had an idol. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Well, if Sifu's not there, I feel like he's kind of out of sight, out of mind. I, that's true. And not on the jury. So it's the third person person had to be filled in there. But mm -hmm. so I think another one could be like Wolf in Goat's clothing is recent, but I feel like if he wins could be good. We've had two animal pieces of iconography from odd number season winners. So that would make it three for three. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, is there anything f from this, Mike? Plus, it's fun to search for my underwear. You know, I've did a play before where I had to be in my underwear on stage in front of other people. So I'm not super concerned about searching for this idol in my underwear. Yeah, I it's think Will, Will strip for the show. I was in college. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm searching for this idol in my underwear. I think Will strip for theater would be a good shirt to put yeah. on. Oh, Mike, what's going on? Is your house haunted? I think my background fell apart. I think my <laughs> my house is stripping. My house is down to its underwear. <laughs> my God. Okay. Uh, but okay. Add add woe for sure to Nana's favorite. Okay. For for Jay. Okay. What about D? Does D have the merch shop going yet? I think D. Obviously. I mean, she's got the. She's already in sales. She's got the backpack. She's got the backpack, which I think could be very simple. It could be like you know property of d or something to give to austin or something like that <laughs> i think it's very simple now look confectionaries are always tough to come by you gotta okay. deal with a lot of suppliers oh boy but how is d's nuts not gonna be a thing d's nuts in the merch store <laughs> 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 yeah okay good good uh i mean i i feel like that we need the bte mm. for the big toe energy yeah big toe i think we need toe socks i think that really needs to be a thing in the d store mm -hmm. yeah um anything else for d i think be like flip-flops could be a good one flip-flops yep any sort of like feet-based iconography i think would be good for her yeah brianna in the chat says uh, she'll get sued like mr beast using d's nuts but she is D. She mm. can just say that. I don't know. Why, why did Mr. Beast get sued? I gotta ask Jesse. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he could get sued for many reasons. Uh, um, I think that that man's just a walking litigation open. He's case. got a lot going on. Yeah. yeah. He can I, no longer use D's nuts. Uh, similar to another company already has D's nuts. I think you By the can... way, my kids, um, I don't think they necessarily know why it's funny, but they that they... <laughs> They got a reaction out of saying that one day from watching Mr. Beast, and then they kept uh, repeating it. What what they get more of a reaction out of? D's nuts or D's retort to that one casual fan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's the, 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 the D's retort. 
I think that D could do. Hmm. Could D do something around? Hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like that's that's the major yeah. stuff for D. You know, like, okay. or could she do like Mother's Day gifts of like Mother's Day cards of like, I would I would swear on you if it meant a million dollars. Mm hmm. Yeah. Hope, hope you get well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think that's <laughs> so. So she's like also apologizing to her mom for the, the the curse that she's put on her. She can make a living doing cameos, being like, "Hey, just wanted to give a shout out from your person, uh, from your son or daughter. I would swear on you in the game any day." Yeah, she can swear on your enemy's parents. Yeah, I think that's actually a great service to offer. I don't know if cameo does that very specifically. That almost seems like more of a like hired assassin type of tactic. Yeah. Okay. Then, all right, what about Julie? Oh, Julie, uh, Julie needs to go into like creating her own emotes mm -hmm. because Julie is so expressive and she has a very artistic side. Remember, she was an art teacher before becoming a lawyer. She painted that beautiful tribe merge flag. So I think she, I didn't know she did that. Yeah. And so I think she creates her own sort of like cartoony style. I think she can make a cartoon. Yeah. Called Screw Drew, where it's like <laughs> Kill Bill. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, how about then Austin? Does Austin have any merch? Will kill for sandwich. Yeah. I think like some like a sandwich recipe book would be good. Toothpicks with his little face on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for after you have the sandwich. <laughs> yeah, you pick your teeth with Austin's face. Kind of like what D does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then what about Katora's merch store? Again, I'm like, oh, Katora deserved better in the edit, but it's it's gotta be like, you know, and Bruce some, repellent. Yeah, some sort of like Bruce repellent. Mm -hmm. Bruce is number two. <laughs> it's like a turd. Yeah, exactly, like a fake turd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, maybe she had, like she could have like something that's like anti lawyer. Like, oh, you know uh, what she could do? She could have a sh uh, a shirt with an arrow in it that says like I'm not with Bruce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not the lawyer. Yeah, I'm not the lawyer would be good. that. I'm with a lawyer. <laughs> that mm -hmm. one there. Asterisk. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mike. Um. Let's see. What else uh, haven't we talked about? Okay. I, well, I, I brought in a game. Oh, okay, game. please. So, so you can take the bloom out of the B&B, &B, but you can't take the B&B &B out of the bloom. We alluded to this a little beforehand, but Rob, I want to bring a new segment in to our seasonal podcast. I would love that. This is called Smoke or Fire. Okay. So the editing has been super complicated this season. Arguably it's best. There has been... So many call forwards, callbacks, Easter eggs, cut twos, et cetera, that have been so good. What I want to do is I want I went through all of my notes from the previous 12 episodes and I highlighted a few comments that might allude to where things go in the future. I want you to determine whether it's smoke, aka it's not mm -hmm. gonna say anything about what happens, or if it's fire, aka sure. this is actually a progenitor of what's to come. I love it. Yeah, so like Smoke, for example, would be the season 39. Oh, I bet a woman's winning this game. Yeah. Season 40, uh, Fire would be the season 41. Oh, a woman always loses to a man in the final three. We want to make sure that not, doesn't happen. Okay. All right. So uh, from that perspective, you said before, but I had this in here. Episode 10, the women say at the sanctuary before wrecking shop that there's going to be a female winner this season. You think that's fire? I think that's fire. I think that's also in conjunction with, uh, I think a lot of times that we've seen the men uh, together. I think that it's been uh, to like the epitome of that was the, um, what what's it called uh, for the boys? Playing with the boys. Playing with the boys. Uh, I think that really we also got that in the episode where Kelly went home, where the girls are talking about Girls Alliance. Like, oh, I wonder what the guys are talking about. And they're talking about like, uh, you ever have really good tacos? <laughs> and even Drew and Austin uh, being uh, two of the guys who were left out of this vote that all of the women are in, along with Jake. I, I do believe uh, very strongly that we will have this was foreshadowing. And I think that there is a ton of fire that a woman will win this season. All right, let's go back to episode one. 
This is one of the opening quotes on the boat. Let's also say, editing myth debunked. I talked about this last time I was on for 44. In the previous four seasons, there was the Matt chat. The idea that Jeff only talks to a few people on the mat before the opening challenge. Yep. All four seasons of the new era, the winner had been talked to on the mat. This case, not. Uh, Emily, I think, was the last one standing during the mat chat, and she was eliminated. But we did get three opening confessionals. Uh, we, of course, we had Drew's, uh, I'm going to be the smartest person to ever play Survivor, infamously. Katura says that she studied the game, and she knows that if you come across as intelligent and strategic early, you'll get voted off, and that she won't say she's a lawyer until she can show her true colors later. Rob, is this smoke or fire? Is this indicating, as we mentioned before, perhaps a low-key Katura win? Oh, uh, boy. Um, I think I'm still all on board the D-Train, and I'm going to... Oh, don't take the D-Train. That doesn't go express. You want to probably no. take the F or the M. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm going to say that I, I think this is smoke. Uh, I, I, mm. I am not seeing the Katura win. I think we've outlined a way that that could happen, but I just from an edit perspective, I don't feel like that we've got enough about her her strategy along the way to get here. We have no idea what her plan is in terms of like who she wants to work with. And so like, I feel like that we've gotten her story like as a character a little bit more than we've gotten her perspective as a player in the game. And I don't mean that uh, I'll be very happy if, if, if Katura wins, but I personally, I don't see it happening on Wednesday. Well, let's go to later in this episode as Reba are all introducing themselves and Julie says that she is an art teacher. And she says in confessional that, okay, I wanted to lie that I teach art classes out of my home. Who wants to give a million dollars to an attorney? Hmm. Rob, is this smoke or fire that one of our lawyers, if they get to the final three, will not win? No, one of our lawyers will not win. Yes, that it's who wants to give a million dollars to an attorney if someone is upfront about who they are as a lawyer? See, this is tricky because you could have said it either way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say that I think that this is who, who will that a lawyer will not win. Yeah, because who will give a million dollars to a lawyer? Do we think this is a prophecy? I will say that I think it is fire because I think a lawyer will not win the game. I do agree with that. And if anything, I think, again, if Katora does win, it's because, and or Julie, it's because they don't reveal that they're a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I think that the most openly lawyer person in Jake could be a bit of that argument, even though, again, he's very young in his career. I don't think he's making the seven figures just yet. No. And, uh, and certainly not on Wednesday. All right. Episode four. This is right after the swap. This is one of my favorite Jake confessionals. <laughs> uh, I got to be ready to jump ship. And thank God I'm a good swimmer. Ha 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 ha. Extended laugh, extended laugh. Yeah. Is this smoke or fire? Or is this a fire that's already been put out? Was this indicating Jake trying to switch things up earlier on? Or could this be indicating something he does later? Are we saying that has anything to do with him actually being a good swimmer? Oh, it could be that as well, though. I don't think we have any more water. Did he challenges. jump ship at any point? I mean, I guess it was it was him trying to turn on julie jumping ship mm, i i mean i i don't know um i mean i don't think it was necessarily jumping ship i just think that that was just like such a wild like uh like he just made himself laugh so hard i think that sometimes people they just put stuff in the edit that's like okay this is interesting i do love i think we've gotten a lot more like I'll say it's smoke Jake is probably the most uncut person we've gotten in terms of confessionals a little bit like Katora. We had the time lapse, Emily. Uh, I think, you know, they let run on for a long time, but like between the clip you played of Jake actually getting sidetracked in a confessional and then getting back to the point and this where they just held on him laughing for what seemed to be 10 seconds. Uh, I do think this is smoke as well. Cause I don't know what jumping ship would imply to him mm -hmm. at this point. Like, He's barely on a boat right now. He's on a rowboat that he got, he got cut. You know what he did? He got kind of cast out from the pirate ship, you know, and he got left out to be on his own and paddle his way back to shore. And now he's like, if he's jumping ship, it's out of his own slightly smaller boat. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't think that there's uh, much foreshadowing here. 
All right, let's go into episode nine here. Emily flat out tells Austin, if D gets to the final three, she wins. And Austin agrees. Mm -hmm. Now, this could be smoke or fire for multiple reasons. This could be foreshadowing, okay, if D gets to the final three, she wins. Or it could be foreshadowing Austin turning on D. Hmm. Huh. I don't think that we've gotten any sort of like Austin saying, like, okay, well, we have to take out D. Uh, he seems very content to go to the end with her. I think that the foreshadowing is that Emily says, like, if she goes to the end, uh, she'll go. Oh. Like, I think it's sort of similar to where Franny is like, say, hey, the, the Tikas, like, should we break them up? Like, I think it's sort of like along those lines. And so I will say then this is fire. Okay. Uh, so then episode 10, here's another thing. We talked about the all female thing. Again, going back to this enigmatic Katora edit, and I don't know if I want to call this smoke or fire because it also deals with the water, but the moment where Katora has a panic attack during the challenge and subsequently when she jumps into the water and is like encouraged by everybody to do so afterwards, is this indicating anything? Is this part of some sort of personal journey we're getting from her? Or was this more so an in the moment, Katora has had a rough tuple, couple of days hearing from her yeah. no contact mother. This is a moment for her to let go. I, I've really been subscribing this season. I've talked about it on a few of the podcasts that I feel like that in the new era of Survivor, for the most part, I feel like that we have, you know, one person, they are going to win. And I feel like it's sometimes you win and sometimes you grow. And sometimes mm. I think that these players have a arc over the course of the season that is one of growth. And sometimes these players have an arc over the course of the season of their ultimate win. And I feel like that Katura has had an arc of growth over the course of the season. I feel like that she's not the winner of the season, but I think that she's somebody that we highlight her journey over the course of like, look at like, the person she became over the course of the season. And I think that that was a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to compound that with the edit from the next episode, because it feels like she hit rock bottom in that episode 10. And then episode 11 is when she finally decides to and got open the letters up. in that episode. Yeah. And yeah. when she finally decides to open up about details that like, she was not even forthcoming about to me in the preseason, nor should she, I'm not saying like everyone, please trauma dump in your preseason press. Obviously like, you do what you need to do. I mean, it's a good time to do it. Yeah, but well, if you want to be in the right headspace, though, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's the day before the game. Do you really want to be thinking about a traumatic experience in your life when you're about to go into this million dollar show? Mm -hmm. So maybe that is that like low key metamorphosis. And it wasn't as underlined as Emily's was. And maybe it might be in the finale. But yeah. I think that's a great sort of tidbit for the new era survivor. You either win or you grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that. Maybe they Drew didn't ultimately get that. I did feel like that we were getting over the course of the season that Drew's story was one of like, well, I don't really know what it's like to bro down. And so he sort of like had like the opportunity to be like part of the bros over the course. Of I the mean, season. his final words, he's literally like, I'm sure I grew from this experience, but I don't really know how. I don't really know how. Know how. Uh, but I think that he like got like a little bit more like self confident in terms of like hanging out socially and being part of like uh, the uh, you know uh, like the group of people that's uh, yeah. You there's, know, go there's, being at he's like uh, he so many of his confessions were like I don't know what's going on here. I'm like the dork at the frat party here. Yeah, but he kept making analogies about being at the bar. So was it like him almost trying too hard? Was he overcompensating of like? When I go to a bar, which I definitely do multiple times, I'm not staying at home playing, uh, you know, playing Baldur's Gate or anything like that. I put my arms around my friends and we all say we're having a great time. I mean, I think a lot of that was also, again, relegated to a secret scene. There was one where, like, Drew sleep talking on a certain week and he was talking about, like, his general anxiety about feeling like he wouldn't get along with people. And so maybe that manifested in him communicating things subconsciously in his, in his sleep. So... Yeah, it's it's interesting. I feel like Drew was not necessarily one to do that. Even for Bruce, it was like like sort of tacked on at the end of him being like, okay, maybe I should talk to my family about yeah. this, even though he didn't necessarily. And I feel like that some of the people that we haven't gotten as much from in the edit, like a Julie, like uh, maybe the challenge of the producers is like, okay, well, if she doesn't win and she doesn't really grow, like because Julie as like a, you know, grown ass person, 
is probably like has like already that she yeah. is fully formed. And yeah, so, I mean, yeah, she went through so much shit in the past ten years. She changed yeah. careers. She got divorced. Like, but but that didn't happen on the island. So yeah. I think that maybe that speaks to some of like uh you know um the moms on Survivor uh where. Heather, is that right? Yeah, like, uh, like, did did maybe she she didn't win, and maybe she also didn't grow. Could that be something with Austin as well? Because I think another reason why we're maybe feeling Austin is five out of five in terms of winner equity is because his edit has been, I'd say, the most two dimensional of everybody who's left because it's pretty much been around advantages and ad d advantages. If you get my drift, uh, and so I feel like again, if he won, it would be a little bit like unfulfilling we feel a little hungry afterwards and maybe that's another thing where we talked about his metamorphosis getting to see those adorable pictures of him as a kid but like does that really happen on the island you know you've already mm -hmm. come out of the cocoon before you came out here unlike someone like emily who was very much undergoing her own grew on the island yeah. yeah okay uh so a couple more here uh in episode 11 Drew walks up to Jake and Katora when they're practicing fire making. First off, let's stop there. Katora and Jake fire making, smoke or fire? Because I think people were saying maybe the counter to, okay, Drew and Austin, Drew and D, uh, Austin and D, I'd say, go in together to combat this whole where I'm going to beat you next time is that we saw Jake and Katora making fire. Do you mm -hmm. think there's a chance that those two, the Bellows, can make fire against each other? Yeah, I think that there is fire. I guess that my prediction for the finale in terms of the way I see it going is I'm going to say that we get the um, Chekhov's idol uh, where then we're going to see the big move coming from Jake to idol Julie out of the game. Mm -hmm. Then D wins final for uh, immunity. Immunity. Immunity and says... I'm going to take my lapdog Austin to the finals. I'm going to take my, my sweetie. Is he the poodle? Yeah. Yeah. And then ultimately Katur and Jake can make the fire. So I'm going to say that it is fire. So you think that they're going against each other? Yes. Do you have any sense as to who would beat whom? <sighs> um, I don't. I, I really. I, we'd have to go back to the preseason press in terms of like uh, who has a better shot at it. And you never know, right? Because like Carson, Mister Boy Scout, the only thing he didn't do, ironically enough, is the first thing a Boy Scout learns, which is to make fire. So like, it mm -hmm. can all go up quite literally in a puff of smoke. But also in that scene, Drew sits down and says, "Okay, listen. If you're thinking about going to the end together." Who's your third? And Katoris sort of replies like, okay, it's more about who we don't want to see in the end. Is that smoke or fire? That's the other side of things. I know that this goes against your prediction, but is there a world where Jake and Katora are sort of the king or queen makers here and they choose between the Rebas to take to the end? I don't see it. I think that they're the, I feel like that the final four immunity challenge winner will be either Austin or D. So I feel like that they are probably the two most likely, least likely people to win final four immunity. Now, what even if though we've had some whack, wacky Romeo wins final four immunity. Yeah. Now, what if Austin wins final four immunity and does the overwood? He throws himself. Oh, that would feels, be very good. He throws himself on his sword for D. He's like, She's if she's going to go in, she'll lose. I'm much better at it. I'll make sure she goes and then I'll go with her to the final three. And then he loses. Yes. He loses final four fire making or he loses in the final three. No, he loses final four fire making. To he who? says. I would Katara? say maybe Jake. Yeah. Like he'd say Jake's failed it so much. You know, That'd I, be a I big moment for Jake, though. I mean, that would be. You know, obviously the most dramatic outcome would be D and Austin going in against each other, but Austin white knighting it and mm -hmm. saying, I don't want D to go in. So I'm going to be the one to take out Jake after he just idled out Julie. That would be incredible television. Mm -hmm. It'd be great. A great moment. Last piece here that I want to bring up. Uh, so in last episode, Jake's, uh, or sorry, an episode uh, back during Emily's boot episode. The Jake says that like, uh, oh, I'd rather not vote out Julie 
uh, or I'd rather vote out Julie. I'd rather not vote out Emily. Drew and Austin agree. They all say that Julie is a threat in challenges and fire making. I'm assuming you're thinking that's fire because you're prognosticating a Julie final five, but you don't think this is like looking ahead to a Julie final four fire making win? Mm, uh, I'd like to see that, but because I love to be wrong at these things and this makes it so exciting to watch the finale, but I'll say I think it's smoke. Yeah, I think it's tough because I usually look at these comments of like, oh, if someone gets to the end, they win as smoke because it's like, why are you spoiling the outcome of your mm -hmm. own season editors by saying, oh, there's no drama in the end. If they get to the final three, they win. But that's why I thought Ben wouldn't win. I thought they kept saying if Ben gets to the final three, he'll win. And so therefore he goes out at four. And I and many people were surprised by the thing that got thrown in to save Ben in the end. So I always have that like little mustard seed going on that there can be some sort of faith yep. that, yeah, maybe they give their ending away ahead of time. Yep. Okay. Mike, uh, AC in the chat says, uh, what if there isn't fire this season? Like Katura mentioned a couple of episodes ago. As much as I would love this, AC, I'm going to have to cool you down, AC. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Much too hot of a take. Jeff Probst, I believe, has said on fire that fire making is here to stay for the time being. <laughs> okay, like anything on Survivor. Uh, Redman uh, makes a good point of that. Uh, for Katura, uh, that would make ironic uh, foreshadowing about her uh, complaining about fire and then making it to get to the final three. That could be the interesting wrinkle on that. Yeah, that would be the most like fire outcome, I think, to that scene where the two of them are trying to make fire. I think that would be very fun. I mean, that we saw shades of that back in 41 when Deshaun couldn't make fire in the pre-merge and then ends up beating Heather in the final four right when he needed it. So... Yeah, I think fire edits, honestly, sometimes might like uh, be better than winter edits in terms of like consistent narrative implications. Mike, overall, looking back at Survivor 45, uh, I saw that there was a thread, I think, on Survivor Reddit about, could you give a letter grade to this season? I mean, I like, I don't want to be an easy grade. Yeah. Did Dalton Ross, that he, he ranked this this week? He did rank it this week. So he ranked it at 25. Uh, 25. But out of it is right below, I think, 44 for him as his, but his second favorite new era season. Okay. I honestly would give this season at least an A minus to A minus. Yeah. Because for me, A, I'm a weirdo. Uh, and I do not necessarily predicate my enjoyment of the season on the strength of the winner and how it ends. Three of my favorite seasons are Pearl Islands, The Amazon, and Co. Wrong. Three seasons that while I love the winners there, I would say from a narrative perspective, mm -hmm. were not like the most fulfilling. We got to see their entire journey over 13 episodes when I think there were larger people of which that would be more uh, satisfying and fulfilling. So it's not like I'm coming in here being like, they better lay on this freaking thing or this season's going to tank for me. I am very much a journey above a destination person. And look, yeah. a lot of it is going to be inflated by the fact that we got 90 minute episodes, which were so good. I cannot tell you how above expectations this season was for me in so many ways. Cause I think a lot of us came in being like, Oh, 90 minutes, 30 more minutes of advantages, I guess. And look, there was some production effery along the way. I still hate the trio lose your vote automatically challenge and then do a math problem to get it back. But at the same time, yeah, I think that was the weakest episode of the season. Although that episode ended up having the huge, like completely set the end game into motion. Yeah, it really did for multiple reasons of like the, okay, this is the person that's most vocal about getting rid of D. They're gone. D and Austin are starting to become a thing. Uh, and, and Austin gives the advantage to Julie. Yeah. So this is one of the most pivotal episodes of the season. It to me, I will again. Before the challenge. Yeah. So I will say that. I really go back and forth between 45 and 42 for me to be completely honest as like my favorite new era season 42 has, I think the more electric strategy and some more wacky characters, both of which I really enjoy. But I think 45 obviously had the much better production. I was really nervous after 44 to be completely honest because 44, especially that first half. Woo. There was, mm -hmm. there was a lot of hip in that hop uh, and not the good yeah. hip. It was a bad hip. And so I was nervous after like the success of the season that production would say, 
okay, so if we want to replicate that success, let's just do that all over again. They have been surprisingly conservative. You know, Jake found the fourth idol in the season, in the penultimate episode. Mm -hmm. They gave out three idols in the first episode of Survivor 44. So I think they showed a lot of restraint there. And I think that compounded with the extra time just allowed this cast to thrive. And I think it's a little bit personally biased because Rob, you and I got to talk about these people and I talked with these people in the preseason. And like, I was seeing a lot of there there. I think it was tough to follow up 44, which had like some of the best characters we've seen in the modern era, some of the most popular players, one of the most well-regarded winners in Jam Jam. But these people brought something completely new. I say it with all the love in my heart. These people are unhinged in so many ways. They all, they, people were quitting. They were burning idols in the fire and then getting yeah. voted out with said idols. They were giving away the shots in the dark. They were piling votes onto people without splitting the vote for whatever reason. Like it felt every episode, something wackadoo was happening, which I think did help lead away from like, okay, if you look at just the voting chart, it was a bit of a pagonging in the middle. I don't mind that as long as I'm interested in the people. And I do feel like I was really interested in the people this season, whether it was the length and runtime, whether yeah. it was the cast, whether it was both. I really feel like that of the five seasons of the new era, and this speaks to what Rob's fact checker had said, like uh, it wasn't just in the edit, but I just feel like that all around, I just feel like that this was such an even season where like last coming off of last season, where it was really, you had like the big three and it was really yeah. all about, you know, Jam Jam and Carolyn and Carson, uh, much to the detriment of like almost everybody else. Like this season has felt very even. The game has felt like very open. Uh, it wasn't really overpowered with advantages all the way through. I feel like that we got like a really good understanding of the strategy and the lay of the land uh, more so than any of the other seasons from the new era. And, you know, that's my biggest takeaway is like, I'm just, I'm very happy with just uh, the way that this season was presented and the use of the 90 minutes all across the way. And so I think we have a, a you know, I think we have a heavy favorite going into the finale, but I don't feel like it's necessarily like, um, like a hundred percent that it's going to be for D where like, there's no intrigue going into this finale. And let me say that again, there were, Things that went well in the season's direction. I mean, remember, there was an opening twist in the premiere that ends up getting cut where Kendra sat in on a tribal council and cast a vote for somebody. Brando found an advantage in his buff at the swap. Both of those did not make the edit because they ended up being for naught, but like certainly some stuff production thrown in. So it's not like they completely went chased on the twist. They were still mm -hmm. dabbling a bit. Look, I have watched probably combine like close to 60 to 70 seasons of survivor over the course of 20 plus years. And there are people who talk to me all the time of like, what do you, people on the street are approaching me the people and on say, the street see you and, and they and say, what they say, first off, I saw you in that dance belt when you were 17 and I've been scarred for life. I'm suing mm -hmm. you. Uh, yeah. But they also say like, so what, what do you look for in a survivor season? And you would think that, like, Rob, you and I are kind of connoisseurs to a certain perspective. You think we're like an Anthony Bourdain, well-seasoned food critic who has this refined palate of what <laughs> Survivor should be. But for me, I just want to watch every episode and have fun. That's really the base level. As Mike White once said. Exactly. Like, fun? Yeah, and so I, I think that you know, that's that's the bar right now. And, and and fun can come in a bunch of different ways. I think some people find, okay, if you want complex strategy, maybe 42 is more of your vibe. If you want like big, positive, rootable characters, maybe 44 is more so your vibe. For me, I just had a great time sitting down and honestly laughing with and at this cast. Mm -hmm. This is one of the funniest seasons I have seen and not just from like a cast perspective. It's not like there are comic characters coming in necessarily the editing. Good God. If Mario Lanza ever decides to come out of like loose retirement and do a funny 115 for the new era, so much comes from 45. There are so many incredible cut twos, things like Katora's silent head shaking montage, uh, uh, confessional, the montage of her talking about Bruce mm -hmm. at length, like, 
you can tell the editors had a great time with the extra length when they felt like they didn't have to fit a set amount into a set amount of sequences. As a result, I think also things falling in our direction is like, we had a tribe get Matt singed. We had yeah. one tribe going back to tribal council again and again and again, which really allowed us to get to know them when ordinarily pre-merge boots are sort of forgotten about in yeah. the large scheme of things. Well, they'll have their moment in the sun, but then they're not really remembered in the grand scheme of things. And even outside of the laughs, there is the beautiful moments of Lulu losing that puzzle yeah. challenge in episode three, which is one of my favorite episodes after they had just won and they were on a high and like the piano music comes in as they can just watch everyone else surge past them and win. Like it is so emotionally affecting. That's another thing that I would typify this season with is emotionally affecting. Yeah. Great points. Uh, I think that perhaps like in hindsight, I feel like that um, I would say that this is a season that I think that the pre-merge was probably better than the post merge ultimately and i would say that i think i probably come down i think that the pre-merge was an a and the uh post merge is probably like a b so i do think i probably end up like probably more around like a b b plus uh overall for survivor 45 but i really felt like that the first uh like the, the start of the season and the three tribes and especially like the storyline of lulu like i felt like that we were on a trajectory that you know this could have been like an all-time not to say that they did anything wrong in the post merge I just feel like that it was a little bit more static in the post merge well i think for me that got lifted by i can't give a post a, a post merge a b that had kelly's blind side and playing with the boys in it mm -hmm. i'm sorry that's one of the funniest things i've seen on survivor and the kelly blind side was just gutting in so many ways from our perspective and from her perspective that lifts it to at least a b plus for me and also i've really been enjoying the like emotionally strategic aspects in the past two episodes as well i know that they have talked, in my opinion, way too much at Tribal Council of like, Survivor's really hard because you care about these people, but you have to vote them out. Like, yes, we get it at this point. You're new to it, but we aren't. But again, this D Austin dynamic is so incredibly unique. The fact that you and I disagree as to like, if the love is dead between them or not, is such uncharted waters. I think it really buoyed my interest for a lot of this. So for me... This does feel like my favorite new era season at the moment. It's mm -hmm. really neck and neck with 42 for me. We're 42. I had so much fun with it, but I felt like more so succeeded in spite of production. Mm -hmm. Is Caleb's shot in the dark? Is that considered pre-merge or post-merge? I consider it post-merge. I okay. listen, call me a purist. I think yeah. when all the tribes and, are together and, and on Colin's one... reminding me about the quit. So I don't know. Maybe a maybe a B for the pre-merge. Yeah. I don't really care. Listen, I love me some chaos and I love me some hot mess. And like those were messy and those were mm -hmm. chaotic. And listen, Hannah's quit saved Emily. Yep. Sean's quit uh, caused like this, this whole kerf kerfuffle with D and seafood to happen. So yeah. yeah. I never was somebody that complained uh, too much about the quits over the, especially pre-merge quits. Yeah, exactly. Like if they don't want to be there, then get them out of the way early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, not not uh, too much of an issue for me. Uh, okay. Gray, Gray also brings up a really good point in the chat. I think this will be a very fun season to rewatch because mm -hmm. I think we're already talking about the narrative moments, the smoke and fire that was called forward. I'll be interested to see the entire fire making process from beginning to end of like, OK, this feels, as I mentioned before, very cohesive in terms of a narrative, perhaps compared to other Survivor seasons. And so once we find out who takes it all, especially if it is a bit more of an out of nowhere winner, like someone like Katora or even Jake, I would love to see, like, to your point about Oops All Gabler last year, like, yep. is there a connecting through line for them? OK, uh, let's bring in a couple of things from social media here. Uh, Brando. Remember Brando? There we go. That's another. I I would say that like he is perhaps the one exception to our rule. I love Brando, but of the like everyone you know had memorable moments. He had his his fun stuff with the, the Nerd Alliance and Pokemon and the mm -hmm. Buff Brando. Yeah, and I think that he's somebody like uh, had he gone farther, I think he could have been like a, a very uh you know rootable character that would have been very memorable. Uh, he, you know. He has that peak Wurtenberger energy of like skinny guy who gets voted off early, but is like killer on social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and so uh, he had a question uh, this week. Uh, he said, happy Survivor finale week. Fun fact, if I made Final Tribal Council, my Hail Mary strategy was to reveal I was actually 17 years old, the first minor to play Survivor. Would that have worked? I... 400 people voted. Okay. Uh, well, double then uh, what I did for my is Drew a villain thing, so I know where your priorities lie, yeah. Internet. I mean, uh compared to what Mike Bloom was doing at 17 years old. Yeah. Ex Whoa. Sorry. Whoa. Now, that would be actually an ultimate thing. No one, if I was 17 and I was looking in my underwear, no, everyone would turn the other way. No one would be like, okay, mm -hmm. listen, I don't want to break any laws. I don't want to get arrested on set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm think actually, I'm I think the rule, I think that the people in the audience would get arrested, not you. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, do they? I guess they blur you out? Uh, are you talking about your play? Well, yeah, I think, like, if you were... If you're, if yeah, I guess if you're naked on Survivor and you're a minor, then yeah, technically people mm -hmm. watching would be committing the crime. Mm -hmm. And and the people filming. Wow, it would be like an equally complicit act. Maybe Jeff Probst should stop asking for <laughs> to apply. <laughs> or yeah. maybe like right. you must be fully clothed at all times. Right. Okay. <laughs> so the same person that makes sure Sammy doesn't have a drink. Make sure you keep your clothes on. All right. Then, uh, Brando, uh, would people be impressed or would they, uh, they'd be impressed and vote for him or they're not giving a child a million dollars? I am obsessed with this idea. This is so funny to me. Because remember, in the preseason, when I talk with Brando, he's like, yeah, I saw my eye doctor the other day and he thought I was 13. So, mm -hmm. like, he could pass. He could definitely pass for 17. I mean, we talk about the folly of the younger player, right? This was talked about a bit with Sammy of, like, Okay, could he actually win? He's not really a, surrounded by a jury of his peers. It would be amazing <laughs> if yeah. Brando's like, "Jokes on you! Wait till everyone at the pep rally sees this one." Mm -hmm. Okay, I was well, I was in the driver's seat, and I don't even know how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a learner's permit. Okay, uh, sixty-three point seven percent of voters said I am not giving a child one million dollars. Okay, wow. The uh, shades of Johnny Fairplay going to the final tribal council in Survivor Pearl Islands and uh, against Survivor Nicaragua, I suppose. Yeah, okay. Mike, let me bring in another clip that was found on the, uh, on, you know, God's internet, okay? <laughs> Lord, I mean Jeff's internet. Yeah, on Jeff's internet, okay. Uh, here's something that I don't know the context at all of where this came from. Um, it appears to be a TikTok. It is, yeah, do you know where I'm going with this? So I've seen it, but I purposely have not watched it because I want to see it for the first time on this podcast. Okay, good. All right. So here is something. And then, um, it is captioned for all winner survivor, uh, okay. was, 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 uh, a thing. Okay. Um, but there's a video that got posted to TikTok of of a young Jeff Probst, I believe. Uh, can somebody confirm if this is real or not? Okay. Oh, is this AI? Could it be? Of oh my is this god. Je okay, oh my Jeff god. Probst. Oh no. And let me put the the sound on here. Okay. Uh let's see what this is. Okay. It's a one piece. Hey, you're foxy. Been here a couple days, just dancing, trying on clothes, you know? It's a shirt jack. Get down. Where are you going? Rock on. Groovy. See ya. The look is complete. It's time to go meet the ladies. Jeff Probst. All right, Mike. Is this real? Is AI? What's going on here? But if you were listening, and also, could you explain what we just watched to the people listening to the podcast? I'm sorry, I just had to wash out my eyes and watch that. <laughs> oh my god! Ugh. What uh, is this? Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so Jeff Probst, his eyes it, were dead here. I, I mean, they should be. I don't How know. How many fingers he an does he ounce. have? There, what's the finger situation? If it's AI, I, like, I think we'll look see, at the hand. I see four, personally, though I might be miscounting. Uh, so, fingers Je and teeth. So, Jeff is in a myriad of uh, 
like 70s casual outfits. And this seems to be like that montage of, you know, okay, let's go out in the room and get changed and come back and the friends shake their heads. Except it's as if everyone shook their heads to every single outfit. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, he's in the background of some sort of like green screen effect where he's in space, I guess, in the middle of purgatory in the nether region trying out a bunch of pickup lines as if he's in the club saying like, Hey there, hey. how's it going? <laughs> hip in my hop. Need a little hip in your hop. <laughs> you need a little hip in your hop. <laughs> uh, people think it's a deep fake. One piece. Hey, you're Foxy. Been here a couple days, just dancing. Try okay. Can we, uh, can we pause this? I, yeah. I, I want to go bit by bit here. Cause there's so much to be mined out of this and i think we need to make very precise cracks or the ore will shatter and lose all its value okay yes all right so let's start with this number so uh, yeah make this big okay so we've got like a crimson red jumpsuit but what i'm confused about is so we've got the colors flared out mm -hmm. but then there's also subsequently some like yeah. basset hound ears yeah. going down as well he's like an extra in like some star trek episode yeah that's the thing it doesn't look 70s as much as it looks like retro future mm -hmm. to me like he's hanging out on you know where he's he's uh definitely in uh where's that place that they go when they want to the holodeck down. no uh Ken forward a uh, risa he's totally in <laughs> risa right now he's got that big risa energy it's a one piece okay so Is now one piece yeah, that's what <laughs> why man <laughs> Why? <laughs> Looks like that you. Is, that's a commitment. Where do you plan on going to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You just have to get... Is he like Jake? Does he have to get completely down to his underwear to go to the bathroom? Does the whole one piece go down with him? Or is he just committing? Is he like... Listen Whoa! To Sorry. Whoa. Yeah, is this going to turn yellow by the end of it? One piece? Okay, so this one... Now we've got a little bit more color matching happening. First off, this is very Reba-coded. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe this is an indicator as to who's going to do well. This, we've got, like, the nice crimson pants. We've got, like, a, a nice pink number. And V would be an understatement. This is, like, deep Vesepia style V, yeah. where it's going basically down to his belly button. What I would say is that my argument against it being a deep fake is that it's so low res... Not low yeah. res. Oh, high res for sure. High res, low res. <laughs> yeah, my pants are wet and not because of the water I poured over my eyes. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, what what fabric is that, Mike? Oh, it's got to be some sort of like satin. Yeah, yeah. I would say satin. I was gonna say mylar, but I'm pretty sure they make balloons out of that. No, not mylar. <laughs> That's very futuristic. Hey, you're foxy. Okay, hold on, no, 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 hold on. What kind of pickup line is this? Hey, you're foxy? But specifically the gesture he's doing with it. Let me see. Like, it needs to be paired with it. Okay. You're foxy. But Hey, you're foxy. <laughs> but, like, was he <laughs> reaching for the subway pole? Like, what? I think he's, he's in the middle of a dance. That That's not a dance. That's he's, like, doing the hustle. That's scratching your armpit. Mm-hmm. Hey, you're Foxy. Like that to me, it's like mid Samba. And Jeff Probst is no Lothario to me, okay? He's not Maxim Chermovsky dancing with the stars. Okay. Now, what do you think about this? Uh, I, I got to be honest, I kind of like this shirt. I, this feels like Jeff stole a sweater from Bill Cosby's closet. Oh. Been here a couple of days just dancing, trying on clothes, you know? <laughs> Now, this is disquieting. <laughs> now, why has he been here for days trying on these clothes? There's no door, Rob. This is where he lives. This is purgatory. I'm trapped here okay. until, I, until I can feast on a poor sacrificial soul to let me out. Yeah, yeah. yeah it does look looks very... like Wesley Crusher, I see. Is, could this be Jeff's like backdoor audition to be on Star Trek Deep Space Nine? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's earlier than Deep Space Nine. I Hester has the Deep Space Nine though SD graphics though. Mm -hmm. is, is that appealing to anybody? If you're saying I've been here a couple days, like, yeah, you, you just get here. Do you want to get with a landmark? No, I've been here for a couple days, just trying on clothes. Yeah, like the implication is yeah. like, yeah, is he locked in a mall? 
<laughs> could be the case. Is this his squid game? Mm-hmm. He's like, uh, yep, been trapped in this compound. Covered my face in condom lube, foxy lady. <laughs> oh, you know, it's a shirt jack. Get down. It's a, it's a shirt jack, Mike. Uh, half I have, shirt, half I jacket. Have, I haven't shirt jacked in years. No. <laughs> Whoa. Sorry. Whoa. Oh, yeah. It's been a while. Usually, uh, I'm not in big public places where a shirt jack is necessary a shirt jack it's a shirt jack yeah that's like uh if you don't want your hands to get dirty is shirt jack the portmanteau to go with for a shirt jacket i mean it's got to be shirted right or... <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he's shirted whoa <laughs> sorry whoa or i guess it'd be jerk shirk it jackert like a <laughs> like a shirt kit. Shirt kit? <laughs> it's a shirt kit. Yeah, shout out, shout out to Wanda. Yeah, yeah. Foxy lady! <laughs> now, do you want to wear a sh- What is a shirt kit? I think it's like a denim shirt. <laughs> what, is it just, what is it, just like a heavy shirt? That implies it could be a shirt and a jacket? I don't know, let's see. Jack, get down. Where are you going? <laughs> okay. It's a shirt jack, you just get down. Get down. <laughs> Get down. Where are you going? Wait, okay, no, this is... is he being ghosted? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's being possessed with like, the dance moves. In the play acting of this, is the person like walking away from this? I think this is an attempt at Night at the Roxbury. Where it's mm-hmm. like, what is love like? Foxy. It's a shirt jack. <laughs> Probes at the Roxbury. <laughs> <laughs> you need a little pip in your hop. Can you rewind it? I want to see because we get like a bit of a, a brief cut. Yeah, so let's let's of course get down, which is yeah, like wait, where you going? wait, 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 wait a minute. Sorry to keep rewinding. Did Jeff Probst dab? <laughs> Did he invent the dab right let's here? See. Uh, it's a shirt jack. Get down. Where are you going? He kind of dabbed. He kind of dabbed. Kind of dabbed, but I think it's, here, a, it's a lot of like the. It's kind of the Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> Back All right, now this pose. All right, now I'm convinced that in this coral shirt, which thank you for correcting me, uh, I'm pretty sure he can't lift his arms above his head. Mm, it's like, like a Bruce he keeps, situation. He keeps yeah. doing these moves because that's like when Bruce emotions. hit his head because his shirt was too tight. He's like, oh, yeah, that's they got you. That's what I, I like. Uh, you know, that's really bring this guy back. I, I, call, I like I get I, that happened to me once. Oh, uh, you foxy laid it as well. Didn't wear the yeah. shirt out there. <laughs> yeah, Bruce, get down. Natalie, can I have your jack shirt? <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> Where are you going? Rock on! Okay. Oh, yeah. why, did, why did Jeb Probst do the O'Toyle rules or Steve Holt? <laughs> Rock on. Groovy. This is amazing. This is one of the greatest things. Wait, what is this from? His personal collection, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. This is what Brian Gummel meant when he said he watched VTs in his trailer. <laughs> Groovy. See ya. The look is complete. It's time to go meet the ladies. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> It's the fact Even that Even is stumped. I can't find where this is from. The fact that he is maybe 3% committed to this, <laughs> and that is genuine. The, 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 the fit is here. It's time to get, get no, the in, The look ladies. is complete. It's time to meet the ladies. Why is he talking like a fence-struck brother? I think that he's always had this, Mike. I mean, he talked last season on the On Fire podcast about how it was very important for him to do the voiceover of that it was previously on Survivor. Like, they've tried to talk him out of the pause. Like, that's always been part of Jeff. Iconic pauses. I mean, have we ever seen his feet? Are we sure he doesn't have paws? (laughs) The look is complete. It's time to meet the ladies. <laughs> but like, what an odd, like a, a walk-in-esque sentence structure. The fit is complete. It's time to, to meet, meet the ladies. Jeff Probst. 
<laughs> okay, well, now I don't know what he's doing there. Yeah, the look is complete. See ya. The look is complete. It's time to go meet the ladies. Just yeah, that's how they should have done the introductions on Survivor the Amazon. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, is this not how you dress when Mark Burnett said you look like Freddie Mercury? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that was just facially, Mike. I'll be completely honest. Listen, let's do away with the underwear. I don't want to mimic the shipwreck component. I want people to be stranded in this wardrobe yeah. from seasons on. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Probst told Brian Cohen, you can't come up with themes, but I yeah. mean, should we do, do, do like uh, like decades of like uh, people in like, okay, it's the four tribes, like 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s and strand people like in clothes from that era? Absolutely. Category is <laughs> Survivor mm -hmm. Chic. I would love that. Uh, I would love, I don't know, some sort of punny tribe as well uh we could do like a winter wonderland theme four seasons four tribes that could mm -hmm. work too i mean also i would just love people in 70s athleisure wear i think that yeah. would be very fun be so funny the fit be is so complete funny. it's time to meet jeff probst okay redmond wants to watch it again from the start here of we course, go all right one go. more time okay it's a one piece hey you're foxy <laughs> been here a couple days just dancing trying on clothes you know it's a shirt jack Get down. Where are you going? Rock on. Groovy. See ya. The look is complete. It's time to go meet the ladies. Jeff Bro. <laughs> Wait, why did he sign off with his own name? Like he's Jason Derulo. <laughs> <laughs> this is what people mean when they talk about a winning edit. This is, you know what it is? Rock I on. Give, I give Jeff Probe so much credit. He made his own fan cam. Which yeah, he invented it. He invented it, basically. He is a pioneer in so many ways. And listen, he made a pregnant pause to get people pregnant. So <laughs> I think that it may be working. He has the success to show for it. God, I thought I hated that, and then I love it, and now I kind of both at the same time. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's Schrodinger's clip. My God, that is... I have yeah. so many questions. So many questions, so... Let me see. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Disco Jeff Probst. Uh, so I don't know where he got that from. Do you think that next season, maybe instead of having people compete in this, they compete for this? They start in their underwear, and every reward challenge is a new yeah, outfit. It's, yeah, it's a new outfit. So it's mm -hmm. like almost like, you know, again, a, a sort of a, a doll accessory thing going back to Barbie. Like this week, want to know what you're playing for? The shirt, Jack. Enough for all of you. <laughs> Get down. <laughs> Enough for any foxy lady. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, that was from All Winner Survivor on TikTok. And we are all winners today, I think, for getting to witness that absolute piece of beauty. Mm -hmm. All right. Mike, anything else you want to say before we uh, wrap things up here? I mean, my mind has just been uh, thrown in a completely different place away from Survivor. What a note to end on, though. What a note to end on. I just want to dance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but your shirt jack on. I mean, what I will say is, despite Jeff not being able to bring his arms above his head, I think this this season went head and shoulders above expectations. And, uh, you know, I am so excited to see what is going to happen in only a couple of days. Again, to your point, it seems like from a momentum perspective and a story perspective and a strategic perspective, it's D's to lose. How many times have we said that before? So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully I was able to bring in some contrary opinions about how it might be Katora's story, maybe even a little bit of Jake's story as well. Regardless, I am really excited and I'm just really happy that we had this experience. Again, and mm -hmm. this is one of the most consistent seasons of Survivor. I think I've seen in some time. Yeah. And I think a lot of people didn't think that would exist in the new era where there's just so much variance from a production perspective. So thank you to everyone out there for yeah. not only engaging and with I, the content for this. I feel like that um, in the new era, like that there has been a lot of discourse about every, we are in the, you know, such a meta era of survivor. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of discourse about everything, but I do feel like that many of the things that were complaints uh or that there were like issues with like there has been an effort to correct you know a lot of things uh is it perfect no is it more perfect than it was even like 
you know, a year or so ago? I, I think so. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, uh, goes back to a very salient point you made over the summer, which is, I think especially watching it on the tail end, or I guess concurrently for a few weeks with Big Brother 25 and kind of watching production sort of look at that and take the dog on fire meme of this is fine compared to Survivor production, which again, I had my doubts, but did legitimately for, for the most part, again, not perfectly, but take a look at this and be yeah. like, okay, we have 90 minutes. Let's bring back opening credits. Let's bring back previously on Survivor. Let's do some more fun thing. Yes, I wish things like the auctions return were more pure and not necessarily made in a way that made things super convoluted. But I, I am really satisfied overall. My base enjoyment of Survivor is just if I had fun and due to this cast and the way the story has been told, I've had mm -hmm. so much fun. And thank you to this cast as well. It has been so awesome getting to follow your journey from talking with you back in April when I had no idea what to expect to talking about you all in the preseason when I still had no idea what to expect to now it's, it's just been a really good time. And I'm, I am a little glad for my own family's sake that, you know, we are ending this big tidal wave of reality TV of the past four months on CBS in this upcoming week. But at the same time, I'll kind of miss it for a little while because survivor 46 is coming in about two months. Mm-hmm. All right. It'll be a short break, but we'll have plenty of stuff uh, coming up, including uh, both Mike and I will have exit press. Uh, Mike, are you mm -hmm. talking to everybody on Wednesday night? I uh, no, I do believe that we are talking uh, on Thursday. Now yeah, it that can was, wait. It can wait. Well, plus, uh, it. I don't think it's really a state secret anymore that the cast will be getting together. The uh, production, I believe, has hosted their own screening of the <laughs> finale for the cast specifically. This is not a fan event like they've been mm -hmm. doing the past couple times. That's another fun thing as well, too, is that like they've tried these new things with these fan screenings, which, as you can experience firsthand, Rob, like are such incredible events. I say time and time again, there really is nothing like watching an episode with a crowd of people. Like, even if the episodes are so-so, there's just an energy level that, yes, you may react at home, but it feels so compounded when you're there with a bunch of people reacting to the same thing. So it's been cool to see the show step out and do that as well. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'll be talking with everybody on Thursday, I believe. That'll be all up at parade.com. Of course, I've alluded to it a lot, uh, but I did talk with Drew. Really great conversation. We talked about a lot of stuff here. But also, if you want to find out the kind of random reason why everyone on Reba thought that Sifu had an idol, you can check that out there. Of course, Rob, you and I covered the finale of The Amazing Race, which had a really exciting finale. Talked with the final three teams there. Did a, a, a fun but random Big Brother Reindeer Games exit yeah. interview with the second and third person booted. Talk about Reindeer Games exceeding expectations. Holy moly. Uh, and I know that we are talking shortly before the fourth episode, so no idea what's going to happen. I'm hoping to talk with at least the winner this week. And also because a new episode hasn't aired, drop this right now if you're watching live. Go watch the last podcast. I will not spoil it. It's an all-time podcast. When the doorbell rings, the hinges blow off the door. Um, a man with more riz than Jeff Probst in his disco getup, ready to bring in all the foxy ladies, but careful out there. He's he is not mm -hmm. single. Uh, so all that yeah. is happening over at parade.com and then over on post show recaps. I'm covering Battlestar Galactica with Josh Wiggler, Fargo with Grace Leader and Latanya Starks. And also on post show recaps, we are building towards uh, our big end of year event throughout this month. We have been doing 2023 in review, a series of podcasts where we take a look back at some of the biggest shows, events, genres, et cetera, of the year. And we have one big show at the end where basically we go through a listener ranked top 10 list of the best TV shows of the year. Scripted only, so apologies. Uh, reality TV will have Sorry. For you. <laughs> Sorry for you. Sorry. You think, how many ladies at the Sorry, response, buddy games. How many ladies in response to Jeff Probst's uh, you know, flirtings in that video said sorry for you to him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get down. Got nothing for you. Uh, I, it is not time to meet. The look you. is the list is complete, so it's time to meet. The winners. <laughs> the list is complete, so it's time for D's feet. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm doing that. And then the last thing that I will plug is a couple of upcoming things in this coming week. Of course, we'll return with the B&B. &B. I talked with Liana as well as Jenny Autumn and Phil T. That was a very fun podcast to break everything down, including talk about our favorite holiday wrapping materials. But speaking okay. of which, do we have a gift for you, everybody out oh. there? For the fifth year running, Rob, can you believe it? Five years ago, you and I sat down and came up with a cockamamie idea 
of doing a brand steel simulation of some of the stars yep. of the year. And we are at it yet again. I have already solicited for a lot of feedback. I've gotten a lot of submissions. So we are going to package the outstanding people, things, characters. Not reality memes. stars, though. There might be a couple of exceptions, but yes, I do understand. But not as like so, uh, that Survivor Big Brother people? Maybe. There might be one or two that cross okay. over, but it's it's much more the exception than the rule. I do... I, listen, I appreciate anyone who gives feedback, but it is a reminder of how much uh, our sort of timeline is cultivated to uh, reality TV when a lot of people are responding with like, you know, uh, Izzy pushing Cameron or uh, like Austin Sandwich. Yeah, the the Spice Girls from Australian Survivor. Like, mm -hmm. we can only go so far, you know. Rob and I can only bleed so much from a stone from that perspective. So we are trying to gather the most entertaining stars of 2023. You can find that thread on Twitter if you want to give your responses there. And of course, you can find my Twitter as well as if you have any last minute holiday gift ideas. And for some reason, you think a Mike Bloom 10 minute monologue dressed in a silly costume is just what the doctor ordered. Check me out at a Mike Bloom type. If you make a cameo, I will try my best to find some sort of best cosplay of whatever the hell we just watched jeff probes do and do my best impression that mm -hmm. i promised yeah you. and don't ask mike to recreate reefer madness okay i mean i don't know if there's any sort of like terms and conditions on i feel like that might have me veering into creating an only fans mm -hmm. but listen i need a resolution for 2024 okay all right well mike this was so much fun. Uh, this so time fun. flew by to go through. Uh, so great job by you, of course. Uh, so many podcasts uh, coming up this week in regards to the Survivor finale. Catch all of our reindeer, uh, reindeer Games coverage. I'm actually going to be absent for Reindeer Games. Oh, My wait. wife has made a dinner reservation uh, that she made last year. For wow. Little did we know reindeer games would be live on a monday night but my wife has made uh, a dinner reservation a year in the making wow i mean that is a who the hell knows where you're gonna be in a year i feel like that's such a far out thing this isn't like a far a wedding. out Th yeah, yeah. Like, foxy foxy uh, lady yeah she said try out those moves rob i think that'd be a great way to end your night early is to be like hey guess what i learned from jeff probst mm. it's called the half dab it's the da <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking about the Survivor Vanuatu guy. <laughs> yeah, I've been here all day trying on outfits. It's podcasting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, you know what? Actually, Rock, you go down the stairs and be like, sorry, Nicole, I've been here for three and a half hours podcasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, uh, you would be nonplussed. That is such a wild commitment to make. Apparently, uh, this is a restaurant that has a lot of holiday decorations. Uh, and so that I guess it's a hot ticket at the holidays. What are you doing like a Christmas tree light viewing in a restaurant? Like, listen, well, I well, now I'm intrigued. Just, yeah, I'll send you pictures. Uh, I'd rather, rather be watching reindeer games. Okay. Is that is Between this us. like uh is this why you believe that Dean Austin won't work out? You're sort of warning them, like, listen. You don't mm. know how far down the rabbit hole gets. Yes. You could be visiting Festival Lights on Parade, the restaurant. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. We're very excited to see more lights. Exactly. Listen, mm. this season has been such a bright light. This podcast has been such a bright light. This is always so great, Rob. And yeah. before we know it, we're going to be back together in the new year, breaking down an entirely new group of uh, Survivor players. Because yep, as I mentioned just, before, just a couple of weeks away. Yeah. Um, let me just highlight one other podcast uh, that over on Nothing But Netflix talked about Family Switch. Uh, have you seen uh, this movie on Netflix with so Jennifer was, Garner and Ed Helms? Was this Freaky Friday? Yeah, Freaky Friday. Double Freaky uh, Friday. It's a holiday movie. Uh, what? Why is it a holiday movie? Because it's uh, Mike. I don't know, but it is. Uh, Wait, what? Like, but is there, is it specifically, or is this a diehard, like, well, there's Christmas trees in the frame, so therefore it's a Christmas movie. I think it's uh, a holiday movie. I feel like it's, a, it, it's basically like, uh, I think it's more than diehard. Okay. That, that just sounds like, <clears throat> I, like Freaky Friday during the holidays. I do feel like that the, the script was written and they, I think they said like, could you make it a holiday movie? Uh, like those are really going to be, those, those do better. And now so, I want to combine Freaky Friday with Gift of the Magi of like, oh, oh, you swap bodies and gifts. Oh my God. Uh, 
I was just going to say that uh, my son, Dominic, joined us for that one in a full family switch. So (laughs) Dominic, Chappelle, and I broke down family switch on nothing but Netflix this week. So did you all switch personalities like Chappelle acted like Dominic? No, well, no, I I, I didn't even get Chappelle involved. Yeah, yeah. Adults acting like children is like veering a little too close for me into, you know, Uncanny Valley. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my next Survivor podcast will come to you uh, live on Wednesday night. Uh, I haven't announced this yet, but we have a uh, big uh, fun finale episode plan when my great friend Jesse Lopez will be here in the studio with me for a live recap of the finale. Makes sense. We now do on-site reunions, on-site podcasts. Yes. And so uh, Jesse lives in the neighborhood. He's going to come by. And so we'll break down. We're gonna, Jesse and I will be up late. There we go. Getting punch late drunk night, at midnight. Late night party here at uh, 11. Luckily, you know, now these days it's not that much later than the regular show. 11.15 p.m. Eastern time for the live show after. And then Stephen and I will get together on Thursday this week, plus all of our exit interviews coming up. Well, that's actually a really good point. We talked about this before we came on of like, okay, it's the big three hour finale. When you take away the after show, it's like two plus hours. When you think that we've had 90 minutes the entire time, it actually won't be an incredible amount longer mm-hmm. than what we're used to. So it's almost like our stomachs have stretched a little yeah. bit in honor of the holiday season. But regard- regardless, I'm excited. Uh, I'm assuming that James Jones is going to be off camera pouring champagne upon Yeah, request. James Jones is welcome to be uh, bartending. So we'll get some pizzas as well. So uh, good stuff. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Everybody, thank Thanks you so much. for uh, the Amazing uh, audience here. Yeah, uh, seriously. Around for all this nonsense. Take care, everybody. Have a good one.